We're live. Okay, thank you. Sergeants, will you please start your recording? PC started. According to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committees on Education, Criminal Justice, and General Welfare. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Okay. Good morning and welcome to the Committees on Education, Criminal Justice, and General Welfare's hearing on education programming uh, in jails and juvenile detention. My name is Mark Traeger and I'm the chair of the Committee on Education. I am joined by my colleagues, uh, Keith Powers, chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice, and Stephen Levin, uh, chair of the Committee on General Welfare, and whom we will hear from shortly. I'd like to thank the Department of Education, Department of Children's Services, and the Department of Correction for being here today to provide testimony and answer council member questions on this critically important topic. Court-involved youth are those students that are arrested and detained or, or incarcerated who have the same rights to a free and appropriate education as their peers. State education law is clear that court-involved youth under the age of 21 and who do not have a high school diploma shall be provided education by the school district which their facility is in. Here in New York City, District 79 is the city's alternative schools district. This includes juveniles, adolescents, and young adults who are in the justice system. All of the important issues that Committee on Education has touched on this last year, including mental health supports, social emotional learning, access to special education resources, and adequate technology, among others, are equally necessary for court-involved youth. Just because a student enters the justice system does not mean our obligation to provide all the educational resources they need to academically succeed ends. In fact, they need more. Justice system invol involvement often impedes educational progress. According to the Juvenile Law Center, 66% of youth in the juvenile justice system drop out, 66%. That is a high barrier to success in life. During this hearing, I look forward to hearing from the administration and what steps it is taking to make sure that court-involved youth are receiving the education they deserve and are entitled to under the law. Deficiencies will need to be explained. Remedial measures to make up for academic loss due to COVID will need to be explained. Resources or the lack thereof will need to be identified as well as how those resources are being spent. Pre-pandemic, this set of students were often an afterthought. The pandemic has not changed that, but it has certainly added to the obstacles and challenges faced by these students. I expect the administration to be prepared to answer committee member questions with forthrightness. And for those questions where an answer is not readily available, I do expect the administration to take the lead and actually follow through with answers uh, by close of business this Friday, April 23rd. Finally, this committee will also hear introduction 1224, sponsored by Councilmember Danny Drum, a local law that would require the DOE, ACS, and DOC to issue a yearly report on educational stats and related incidents pertaining to juvenile delinquents, juvenile offenders, and adolescent offenders in ACS and DOC facilities. Before turning to Chairs Powers and Levin, for their opening remarks, I want to thank the committee staff, Malcolm Butterhorn, Cleva Johnson, Jen Atwell, Chelsea Betamore, Missy Sarkissian, Frank Perez, and my own staff, Anna Skate, Vanessa Ogle, and Maria Henderson, and Janine Caracchetti for preparing for today's hearing. I will now turn to my colleague, Chair Powers. Thank you, Chair Traeger, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. I am City Council Member Keith Powers, Chair of the Criminal Justice Committee here in the City Council. I'm glad that you all have been able to join us remotely today for our joint hearing on educational programming, jails, and juvenile detention. 
Um, I actually was at Rikers yesterday and we did talk about this a bit uh, related to young adults and education and programming. So this is a, uh, a good timing in terms of this conversation. Um, on any given, I think as folks know, as any, on any given day, there are approximately 450 to 500 young adults between the ages of 18 and 21 in DOC custody. These young adults are entitled to an education to help them achieve a high school diploma or a high school equivalency diploma. During the suspension of in-person learning due, due to COVID-19, students on Rikers Island went weeks without receiving additional educational programming and cannot communicate with teachers or other educational staff to get support with their learning. Instead, students had to rely on packets of paper worksheets, something that was reiterated to us yesterday by staff and confirmed yesterday by staff. Uh, so today we'll be asking DOE and DOC to tell us how they are addressing the educational disadvantages of young adults in custody caused or exasperated by the pandemic. Um, we have a lot of questions here and concerns, including the quality of education young adults receive while in DOC custody. Do the rising levels of violence educational program is frequently interrupted by alarms and lockdowns, making it difficult or sometimes impossible for young adults to learn. Further, they may be shackled to restraint desks during school sessions, something we have seen up close and personal. Uh, DOC was required to end the non-individualized use of restraint desks, desks by April 15th, which is a week ago, 2021. We, of course, would like to know whether that has ended and how DOC tailors their policies to ensure the least amount of disruption to educational programming. It's obvious that education is a critical key to rehabilitation and successful reentry for young adults. Today, I look forward to hearing from the department about ways in which its policies, practices, and programs support the goal of ensuring young adults have an adequate education when released. With that said, I want to thank the committee staff here and the city council for putting together this hearing. I want to thank both chairs for their work and their effort to uh, put this hearing together as well and all the council members who will be acknowledged momentarily. Uh, I want to um, uh, just to hand, now hand it over to council member Steve Levin, who is the chair of the Committee on General Welfare to give his opening remarks as well. Thank you very much, Chair Traeger. Um, if you give me one moment, I will bring up my opening remarks. Thank you. Please bear with me. I am doing uh, double duty with my children this morning. So, okay. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this hearing on educational programming in jails and juvenile justice. I'm Councilmember Steve Levin, Chair of the Committee on General Welfare. I want to thank my colleagues, Councilmember Mark Schrager, Chair of the Committee on Education, Councilmember Keith Powers, Chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice, for convening today's hearing. The Committee on Education will be hearing intro 1224, sponsored by Councilmember Danny Drum, which is a local law in relation to requiring the Department of Education, the Administration of Children's Services, and the Department of Correction for, to report on educational programming for juvenile delinquents, juvenile offenders, and adolescent offenders. Um, as you may, no, some of the council's committees have been recently reorganized uh, 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 with issues related to juvenile justice are now within the purview of the general welfare committee. Um, in May 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, ACS released a revised plan for their providers related to modifying staffing and training requirements in congregate settings. In addition to the health and safety concerns for youth and staff in congregate settings, there's also much concern about adequate access to remote learning for youth in these detention settings. Problems persist for students in jails and detention facilities as it relates to sufficient access to instruction and learning materials. Even when devices are available for use, access to technology for youth in detention is dependent on behavior, on behavior with devices taking away with devices being taken away as punishment. In place of those devices, students are administered a paper packet for lessons. As reported by the city, the, the news organization, the city, 
uh, ACS and DOE are working to expand access through secure voice communication for remote learning, as well as expanding tutoring services. However, there's been no timeline for implementing such a change. In today's hearing, the committee will seek a better understanding of ACS's effort to ensure that appropriate safety measures, adequate resources, and a quality education are provided for youth in detention facilities. I want to thank advocates, members of the public, and those with lived experience who are joining us remotely today. Thank you, representatives from the administration, for, for joining us. And I look forward to hearing from you on these critical issues. Um, and I want to thank my staff, my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, as well as my, legis my legislative director, Nicole Hunt, and committee staff, Aminta Kilowan, senior counsel, Crystal Pond, senior policy analyst, Natalie Omery, policy analyst, and Dan Krupp, finance analyst. And thank you so much. I'll turn it back over uh, to Chair Traeger. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levin, and thank you, Chair Powers. I just want to note that we've been joined by Councilmember Strum, Councilmember Riley, Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Diaz, Councilmember Grudentrick, Councilmember Holden, Councilmember Borelli, Councilmember Lewis, Councilmember Gennaro, Councilmember Brennan, Councilmember Rivera, Councilmember Barron, Councilmember Kalos, and Councilmember Lander. And if we missed anyone, my apologies, we'll make sure we, we, uh, we list you. And with that, we will now hear from the administration. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Councilmember Danny Drum, who's going to speak oh, quickly. Yes, on my apologies. Yes, Chair Drum, please. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just need to switch back because one of my um, devices went out on me. So just bear with me one moment, if, if, you, if I may. Thank you very much. Um, my first impression of the East River Academy, the Department of Education's program on Rikers Island was deeply troubling. From this and subsequent visits, news stories and conversations, a partial picture emerged. Corrections officers, for example, shackled students to desks and indiscriminately sprayed chemical weapons into classrooms in response to incidents. Needless to say, it was an environment that was not conducive to teaching or learning. If any educational setting needed intensive oversight, it was East River Academy, yet very little information, even on basic metrics, was available. The 2016 Education Committee hearing that I chaired only highlighted these gaps in our knowledge. The next year, the council passed and the city enacted my legislation requiring reporting on the education system for incarcerated adolescents and young adults up to age 21, including statistics on attendance rates, standardized test scores, the rates of violence and other key indicators. After the raise the age and the bulk of the 16 and 17 year old moving out of Rikers, it became clear that these reporting requirements would need to be expanded to our juvenile justice system. There is much to criticize about our juvenile justice system, but it is undoubtedly a much better place than our jails. With administrators and staff equipped with training on youth issues, at least the possibility exists of impacting young lives positively. Operating under the Raise the Age and now COVID, Passengers Academy has faced several major challenges over the past few years. What has not changed is the critical role education plays in ensuring our young people do not ever experience jail or prison. As responsible policymakers, we need the relevant data to monitor this key component of our city's transition to evidence-based criminal and juvenile justice systems. And that is what intro 1224 requires the city, excuse me, to provide. Thank you, Chairs Traeger, Powers, and Levin for joining forces on this issue. I look forward to hearing from the administration and from the advocates. Again, thank you very much, and I apologize for not having a picture, but one of my devices went out. Thank you again. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. Um, I am now going to go over some procedures for today's hearing, um, and then we will go ahead and swear in the administration. Um, we also want to recognize that we've been joined by council members Adams and Cornegy. So thank you, Chairs Traeger, Powers, and Levin. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Joint Education, Criminal Justice, and General Welfare April hearing. I am Malcolm Butehorn, Counsel to the Education Committee. Before we hear testimony from the administration, 
as with all education virtual hearings held to date, there are a few reminders I would like to go over. I will be calling on witnesses to testify in panels of four to five persons. So please listen for your name to be called. I will be announcing in advance who the next panel will be. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. So please listen for that cue. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. At the end of the two minutes, please wrap up your comments so we can move on to the next panelist. Council members present, for those of you who have questions for a particular panelist, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you in the order with which you raised your hand after the full panel has completed testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. This includes both questions and answers. And please note for the, that for the purposes of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Chairs present, please hold your questions until the conclusion of an entire panel giving their testimony. Then I will call on you in the order with which you gave your opening statements, and then I will turn to committee members. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify and answer questions. From the Department of Education, we have Executive Superintendent Tim Lasante, Superintendent of District 79, Robert Zweig, and Deputy Superintendent for Alternative Schools, Nick Maradacci. From the Department of Children's Services, we have Associate Commissioner Charles Barrios, Juvenile Justice Programs and Services, Division of Youth and Family Justice. We have Stephanie Dueno, Director of Educational Services, Division of Youth and Family Justice, and Johan Paguero, Assistant Commissioner, Close to Home, Division of Youth and Family Justice. From the New York City Department of Correction, we have Francis Torres, Assistant Commissioner of Education and Youth Advocacy Services, Stacy King, Executive Director of Educational Services, and Charlissa Walker, Assistant Deputy Warden, Robert N. Devoren Complex. I will first read the oath, and then I will call on each of you to individually respond. If you could please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Executive Superintendent Lasante? Yes. <clears throat> Superintendent Zweig? Yes, I do. D.S. Marinacci? Yes, I do. Commissioner Barrios? Yes, I do. Stephanie Dueno? Yes, I do. Johan Peguero? Yes, I do. Commissioner Torres? Yes, I do. Stacy King? Yes, I do. And A.D. Warden Walker? Yes, I do. Thank you. Finally, for question time, due to the large number of administration officials present, anyone that will be answering questions with the DOE, the first time you answer a question, if you could please state your name before you speak, it will make it more clear in the official transcript who is speaking. Executive Superintendent Lasante, whenever you are ready. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairs Gregor, Powers 11, and all the members of the Committee of Education, Criminal Justice, and General Welfare here today. My name is Dr. Timothy Lasanti. I'm an executive superintendent of the schools, which includes D79, the District for Alternative Schools and Programs at the New York City Department of Education. I'm joined by uh, Robert Zweig, superintendent of District 79, and Nick Marinacci, deputy superintendent for Alternative Schools, and deputy superintendent Jacqueline Jones here in our office in Jamaica, Queens. I'm also joined by uh, our other colleagues from uh, the Administration of Children's Services, ACS, and the Department of Correction, the DOC. Uh, we are pleased to be here today to discuss our work in providing educational programming to detained and incarcerated youth and young adults. One of D-79's central missions is to provide high quality educational programs in residential and correctional facilities serving New York City students. To this end, D-79 operates two schools that we're gonna discuss today, Passages Academy in partnership with ACS, and East River Academy ERA in collaboration with the DOC. Providing education to these students is both a legal and a moral obligation, and that we continue to invest in and work hard to improve. While the COVID pandemic has posted several operational challenges, 
We have worked closely with both ACS and DOC to provide students with instruction and support during this challenging time. The DOE provides placed and detained students with access to the same courses and many of the similar extracurricular activities as their peers in traditional schools. We assign certified teachers, principals, assistant principals, guidance counselors, social workers, and school psychologists to provide academic and social emotional support to young people and adults in detention and secure environments. The curriculum is all standards based and aligned to each student's uh, individual educational pathway. Class sizes are small and personalized as part of our continued efforts towards knowing students so well that we can better meet their students' individual academic and social emotional needs. At both DOC and ACS facilities, we provide a robust support for our students. At Passage Academy, we have 20 student support staff for 175 students, which is about a nine to one ratio of, uh, of support. And at ERA, we have 14 staff dedicated to student support and transition for 233 students, which is a ratio of 16 to one. To ensure our students are prepared for and supported upon their exit from detention, we employ transitional counselors whose primary responsibilities center on supporting young people and adults when they are released. Additionally, we partner with uh, other community-based organizations such as GOSO, which is Getting Out, Staying Out, Friends of Island Academy, and Future Now, which is located on the campus of Bronx Community College. We also assign DOE staff to support youth and uh, adults with education and counseling when they return to their communities. Uh, unlike other jurisdictions in New York State, both of these programs remain, uh, Passages and East River Academy, a part of the New York City school system to provide students with the automatic right to return to their home school upon release. The true benefit of our structure is, at D79 is that it encompasses both these programs as well as the transfer high schools, consortium schools, and international schools. This means when a student transitions out of uh, Pasadena County or ERA, ERA, they can remain within the same school district uh, that, they, that already knows them. From day one of this pandemic, we committed to supporting our students in detention as they continue their education. Both during the pandemic and in general, our overarching challenge is how to most effectively balance safety and security requirements with providing high quality education in these settings. Our commitment remains uh, to provide each student with personalized learning experiences and support systems they need to achieve success in school and beyond. I don't know how much time I have, but do I have time to get into the, the two schools? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. First, uh, again, it's important to explain the differences between the two schools. Uh, first, we'll talk about uh, Passage Academy, which is our partnership with ACS. Uh, first of all, it's a multi-sided school that provides uh, middle and high school academic instruction and supports for students who are arrested for crimes they were alleged to have committed prior to turning age 18 and who were ordered to be detained pending trial or placed in residential settings following the trial. Students receive instruction from certified New York State teachers at the facility or attend Passes Academy sites, depending on their court ordered setting in detention or close to home. This school year passes has uh, 175 students enrolled across the uh, passage, seven passages sites. All Passage Academy sites provide full day of classes using a trimester system. Passage Academy provides licensed subject area and special education counselors and uh, teachers and counselors and school leaders to meet the educational needs of all students. Uh, it has 82 teachers uh, for the 175 uh, students, ensuring a highly personal personalized education experience for students. The coursework as at any high school in New York City is aligned to the state standards and in, in instruction, provides college ready supports and follows the New York State high school graduation requirements. Teachers are held to the same standards as their colleagues in district schools. Our results during, the uh, during this administration demonstrates a real commitment uh, 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 we've made to this program and to these students. Over the last eight years, the middle school promotion rate at a Passage Academy has increased by 36%. Because of the small class sizes and individual attention, 
we were able to provide the course pass rate in the last three years, uh, uh, pre, pre pandemic was over 80% for all students, including students with disabilities and English language learners. On average, students earned nearly six credits during their time at Passages, even though the median length of enrollment was just 35 school days. We have redoubled our efforts throughout the pandemic, working closely again with our partners at ACS to deliver meaningful education to our students despite the many challenges caused by this health crisis. Last summer and fall, we formed a school reopening committee comprised of district and school leaders, our ACS partners, and also our union partners to proactively address barriers posed by the pandemic and this unique population of students. Understanding the need for our students to connect to remote learning, we collaborated with ACS and distributed Chromebooks to all Passages students so they would have access to technology uh, for instructional purposes. At the same time, we restructured our curriculum to make it more digitally accessible. We have been pleased to implement a blended learning for youth in ACS uh, care, just as students citywide have done participated in blended learning. We are hopeful that we will uh, further opportunities for in-person learning uh, in the fall, as soon as it's safe to resume uh, in-person learning. We continue to meet with ACS regularly to monitor the progress and the processes and the student outcomes while troubleshooting any issues that arise. Of course, families are key partners in this work. Uh, like district schools, Passages has two full-time parent coordinators and one full-time family and community engagement liaison. We convene regularly parent-teacher conferences to ensure communication with parents. With our students dealing with the hardships of the pandemic, family engagement during this time has been critical and we have continued to pursue strong communication efforts through educational planning meetings with parents and our partners at ACS. Finally, additionally, we offer significant guidance and services when it comes to transitioning our students out of Passive Academy when they leave. Transition counselors, specialists, typically social workers and guidance counselors, develop a transition plan with the students while they're in Passages. This includes short-term goals, and most importantly, immediately next steps after leaving Passages. The specialists engage with students and their families about the key decision either to return to their previous school or to transfer into a different school. These specialists continue to follow up with the passage of students for the first six months of their transition back into the community. Now I'd like to talk about uh, uh, East River Academy, our partnership with DOC uh, on Rikers Island. Uh, East River Academy is overseen by a, one principal and it's fully staffed with 65 certified New York State teachers and 59 staff, including counselors, administrators and support staff. ERA serves students being detained between the ages of 18 and 21 on Rikers Island and educational services on Rikers Island are not mandatory for this group of students because the young uh, adults uh, range in age from 18 to 21. They have the discretion about attending school. <clears throat> Currently, East River Academy has 233 students and we are proud that the city provides far more than the three hours of educational instruction required by in, uh, in jail by state educational law. In an effort to continually improve student outcomes, we collaborate with the DC on a system that identifies the educational needs of each young person upon admission <clears throat> as part of their orientation and to have their educational goals and needs factored into their housing placements while, uh, in the, uh, 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 while on Rikers Island. Uh, much like Passage Academy, a very small st uh, student to teacher ratio, uh, to, to about six to one ensures a more personalized approach at East River Academy. All students enrolled at East River Academy pursue either a high school or a high school equivalency pathway, depending on their age, how many credits they have and what they, what they prefer. Students uh, on a high school pathway take high school courses and earn credits while they're at East River Academy. Students on a high school equivalency pathway Focused on preparing for the test of assessing secondary completion, which is the task exam, which replaced the GED exam a couple of years ago, which is required to earn a high school equivalency diploma issued by New York State. Due to the health and safety concerns presented uh, by the pandemic, we have unfortunately not been able to administer the high school equivalency exams uh, on Rikers Island. However, 
Uh, now that we've been able to transition to blended learning and in-person learning starting next month, we will be able to resume monthly testing for those eligible and interested in taking the high school equivalency uh, exam at East River Academy. Again, once the pandemic hit in New York City, DOE convened with our agency partners uh, at the DOC and union partners to develop a plan that would address our goals in providing high quality education while ensuring that the safety and health and, and, uh, and security concerns are all met. At the beginning of the school year, ERA started entirely with remote learning in light of the health and safety issues. The DOE partnered with, uh, the DOE partnered with DOC to provide uh, paper packets created by our teachers and core academic subjects, uh, and they would deliver to students in their housing areas. Uh, teachers then collected and reviewed these packets for feedback and further instruction on a bi-weekly basis. Students also had access to their teachers and counselors by phone through hotlines dedicated for this purpose. Phone hotlines. Uh, in addition to the packets, DOC provided us with access to computer tablets that provide uh, the population with supplementing programs. Our teachers and students were able to use the tablets to upload educational content and videos, carry out assignments, and interact with student questions. Now that we're happy to report that beginning April 5th, teachers and support staff are providing both on-site, in-person, and remote learning services for ERA students at RNDC and Rosen Singer Center. ERA staff is also engaged in family support in a number of ways. The schools hold parent-teacher conferences regularly, just like the DOE schools do. Uh, ERA also convenes a monthly parent support group at LaGuardia Community College, where parents of current and former students gather under the facilitation of a clinical social worker to help manage the complex issues connected with, uh, to having an incarcerated child. So this is supporting parents uh, in the community uh, with their, uh, their, their uh, children. Students can also attend this support group with their families after they are released. Despite the many obstacles presented by the pandemic, we have continued our parent engagement efforts through Zoom meetings and parents and family connection newsletters. And again, similar to Pass Academy, we have 10 transition counselors at East River Academy who work with these 233 students at ERA to help them plan well in advance for their next educational program. As mentioned earlier, because of this program is part of the D79 network, students have the opportunity to access a seamless transition to a range of different educational programs while remaining part of a district that they are familiar with and has familiarity with them. And looking ahead, the pandemic provided us with an opportunity to learn ways to engage in our students and reinforce our best practices when it comes to educational programming in residential and correctional facilities. As we did prior to the pandemic, we continue to work closely with our agency partners at ACS and DOC to ensure we are meeting the educational needs of every student. This past year showed us that using technology with this, uh, within these spaces are powerful tools, and we will continue to innovate and build on the lessons that we have learned. Like the rest of the educational system, we are looking forward to providing even more personal instruction and similarly, we are playing an, in, an increased summer programming this year, including not only academics, but enrichment programs, uh, uh, SEL programs, and summer youth employment opportunities where possible. As to the proposed legislation that uh, Council Member Drum just uh, discussed, we are briefly, uh, uh, we are, uh, let us we briefly turn to this proposed legislation, intro number 1224, that amends local laws relating to reporting on educational programs for juvenile delinquents, juvenile offenders, and adolescent offenders. We support the goals of this bill highly and look forward to working with council to ensure that the reopening requirements align with the current programming, uh, the, that the reporting requirements align with the current programming model and practices. In conclusion, throughout my career uh, and doing this work at the DOE, I've witnessed uh, marked improvements we have made in educational programming in jails and juvenile facilities. Uh, our city has a unique unified district dedicated not only to supporting the education of students in detention, but also designed to promote smoother and more thoughtful pathways to transitioning to high schools and continuing education upon reentry. The pandemic has certainly created immense hardships for our students, their families, as our staff, and our educational processes. But despite those 
uh, new challenges. Our commitment to providing high quality education and support for our students remains unwavering. And we continue to work diligently with our agency partners towards these goals. Thank you very much for holding this important hear hearing and we look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. I uh, just wanna note that we've also been joined by Council Member uh, Levine, Council Member Gibson and Council Member Van Bramer. Um, I will now uh, begin with some questions. Uh, what is the total enrollment at uh, Passages Academy and East River Academy sites? Um, and, and can you give us a, a breakdown uh, also by uh, race and gender? Uh, at this time, we don't have the race and gender. We can, uh, oh, we'll get that to you by Friday, but we do have the, uh, uh, the number of students that are being served currently, 175 students at Passages Academy. And uh, what was it, 133 East, 233, 233 East River Academy, sorry. And, and Superintendent, uh, just for, for our knowledge, uh, why isn't the data on race and gender available now? Oh, we, I'm sorry, we do have it. I'm gonna ask Deputy Superintendent Marinacci to um, go over that data, I'm sorry. Sure, thank you. Uh, Chair, the um, data for East River Academy, I'll do that first. Um, East River Academy is 10% uh, female, 90% male, 56% black, 34% Latino, 5% white, 3% other. And would you like me to do Passages Academy now? Yes, please. Sure, uh, Passages Academy currently is 8% uh, female, 92% male, 64% uh, black, 29% Latino, 4% white. Uh, do you have data on the number of students at both the academies uh, with uh, IEPs and how many are multilingual learners? Yes, we have that data. Um, Hold on one second. Uh, yes, yeah, so for Passages Academy, out of the 175 students, 114 have IEPs and 14 are English language learners. And for East River Academy, out of the 233 students, 110 have IEPs and 33 are English language learners. These are current snapshot data from last week. Uh, and do you have the most up-to-date attendance data for Passages and for East River? Yes, give me one moment. Um, so for Passages Academy, the most up-to-date um, attendance data is 96% overall. Um, for Crossroads, uh, secure juvenile detention is 91%. And for Horizon, it is 94%. Now, are all, are all students who are eligible to participate in these programs, are they all opting in for these educational programs? Because in our, in our briefing, we had learned that a significant number of students are, have, are not enrolled in educational programming. Is that correct? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, so, uh, council member, I think if you're, if, uh, if we're talking about Passages Academy, all of the students are compulsory age. So they are, we work with ACS and all students are required to attend educational programming. There are a couple of students who are graduates and we have to provide alternative programming for them. And, and how is attendance taken, uh, in, in Passages and East River Academy? Uh, Passages Academy right now, well, pass both are on a blended learning model. So I'm going to speak to Passages Academy for the students who are in person. Obviously, we, we take their attendance when they come to class. For the remote students, we follow the attendance procedures uh, similar to the rest of the Department of Education, which we, we measure the interactions and we record those. And are all students 
in receipt and possess technology and internet connection because there was there was some there was a report that um, that was a barrier for many of those students. Uh, so to date, are there any students in Passages or East River that don't have as access to technology and internet? And are they uh, learning through another platform at this time? Sure, so I'll speak to Passages Academy first. Um, at Passages Academy, all students are issued a Chromebook by the Department of Education. And so all students have devices. Um, uh, in terms of internet connectivity, these are not DOE facilities, so I would defer to my colleagues the ACS if they have anything to add about internet connectivity. Um, if we can unmute Charles Barrios. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Nick. Um, so last year we adapted immediately when the pandemic hit um, to transition many functions that were previously in person to remote and have continually worked to ensure that these functions operate seamlessly. Um, this included installing additional um, hotspots throughout our secure facilities, um, thereby increasing our bandwidth. Um, so there have not been any issues related to Wi-Fi or bandwidth. So uh, just to be clear, every student who has requested a Chromebook, the, the appropriate technology, and also there are students with IEPs who might require adaptive technology in order to receive instruction. Is the DOE or any of the agencies aware of any students who are still requesting, whether it's technology, adaptive technology, or internet services, or have we met, have we met those needs? Good question, Chair. I will defer back to the, uh, my colleagues at the DOE. Again, um, thank you, Chair Chager. Every, every student at past days who's enrolled receives a Chromebook through the DOE. Now, you, you mentioned passages. Now, it's my understanding that uh, participation at East River Academy is not uh, compulsory. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, again, uh, students are over 18 years old so it's voluntary for them to come and uh, again thank you for that question and thank you for also your advocacy for the non-compulsory age students uh, so we provide uh, full services to students that are 18 19 20 uh, 21 years old and the other thing that I want to point out with the non-compulsory age students is that adult education now is uh, under our auspices at, at access meaning that students when they age out of 21 can stay in our system seamlessly as well. So it's voluntary, non-compulsory non age in East uh, River Academy. So how many students are not enrolled in the program at East River Academy? Um, I'd have to, um, we only know how many are enrolled. We don't have access to the, the Department of Correction data on the overall population. So we have 233 students enrolled currently. One of the things- DOC on the call? Yeah. We can go ahead and unmute the Department of Correction. Have you graduated? Good morning, Chair. My name is Francis Torres, and I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Education for the Department of Correction. We'll be very happy to work with our partners at the DOE to give you that number by your set deadline this Friday, since they know the number of students who are enrolled in school, we could go back to our daily census and work with them in order to afford you the data by Friday. I, I just, you know, want to note that this is basic data. This is not, this should not be complicated or hard. And this is information that should have been made available at today's hearing, because uh, we're talking about all of our students. Um, and uh, so we would like that information as quickly as possible, uh, because we need to have a holistic picture of what's happening uh, at, at, these, at these academies. Can, can DOE get, uh, provide for me, what is the social worker to student ratio 
at passages. And then we'll ask the same question for East River Academy. Yes, Chair Trigger, thank you. Um, and we appreciate how devoted you are to the student support services, particularly through social workers. So we, we have a combination of uh, social workers and guidance counselors at passages. And it's a ratio of approximately one to nine. Um, that's at passages at East River Academy. It's a, approximately a one to 15 or 16 ratio of counselors, social workers to students. So, uh, and, and what is it just for social workers? Uh, passages, go ahead. I'm sorry. Passages no. Academy has 14 social workers. Passages uh, at how many sites? Uh, there are seven sites at passages, but does each site have a full-time social worker working in that site? Some social workers are assigned to multiple sites. Some of the sites are very small. So there may only be a, a few students at a particular site, uh, particularly the limited secure placement sites. And what about East River Academy? East River Academy has five social workers and five guidance counselors. What is, do you have data on uh, teacher retention, teacher uh, turnover rates um, at, at both passages and at East, East River Academy? Yes, we do. Uh, if you give me just one moment, I just want to find that. Um, but I can, before I find the actual number of teachers, I can tell you that uh, we have very low turnover rate and we experienced uh, almost no attrition due to the pandemic. Um, do you want the total number of teachers? Uh, correct. And uh, if you have data about the average, you know, how, how long they stay working at, at the school. I know when we've done this uh, survey in the past, it's very similar to the transition rate uh, of uh, teachers uh, outside of um, these programs. And we do have an awful lot of people who have dedicated their entire careers, uh, been out there 20 and 25 years, including the principal. She's been there 25 years uh, at East River Academy. She was a teacher when I was a principal. She's got a background in special education. And the same as that principal in Passages, he has a background as a school psychologist. Not too many school psychologists become principals. So I think we have two leaders in these two programs who have been there a long time and really uh, uh, have provided de dedicated services and very special uh, leaders. At the numbers. You have the numbers? Yeah. Uh, so for Passages Academy, there are 82 teachers. And for East River Academy, there are 39 teachers. And Chair Traeger, if I may, it's Robert Swag. Um, while we may not have exact retention rates at this point, we can get them. But it, it's important to note that the average teacher salary, which is how the DOE kind of classifies seniority uh, for budgetary purposes, in both programs is around $100,000, which is the high end of salary. Now, Clearly, that does not mean that these teachers have been in these facilities all these years, but they are veteran teachers and the turnover anecdotally, and I understand we need to get you the, the exact retention, is really very minimal, very minimal. As Dr. Lasanti said, from our administrative staff, to our teachers, to our support staff, um, most are tenured and most have been there for many years. And, and how many... Uh... How many power professionals, or are there any powers that work at, at East River or Passages? Yes, um, there are power professionals at both. I don't know the exact number of power professionals, but in both programs for Passages, there are 30 support staff. That's a combination of power professionals, DC 37 community titles and uh, secretaries. And for East River Academy, there are 34 uh, support staff. Well, the reason why I asked about powers is, is that and again, I, I, I'm not privy to obviously what's in the IEPs, but in many cases, when a student has an IEP, they might require the support of a paraprofessional, someone beyond just the regular classroom setting. Um, and so do you have data with you? What is the percentage of students with disabilities who received all of their mandated uh, IEP services this year? Uh, and how, do that, how does that compare to previous school years? Um, so when we're talking about students with disabilities, um, I think it's important to give a little context here about how services are delivered um, to students in these settings. So students in both Passages Academy and at East River Academy on Rikers Island um, 
have a special education plan developed for them during the time for which they are there. Um, that special education plan, the reason for the special education plan is the result of uh, two um, pieces of uh, uh, two court cases. Um, one is still ongoing uh, for Rikers Island and one is settled uh, for ACS. And both of those court cases mandate us to create a special education plan. We call it a SEP for students uh, with disabilities. So the SEP, to create the SEP, our teachers and counselors um, consult the IEP from the previous school. They assess the student. We have 30 days to complete the SEP. Um, so we assess the student needs within those 30 days and we develop a SEP. Um, the SEP includes testing accommodations and related services. Um, again, it does not mirror the IEP because it's designed for, uh, to serve the student while they're in the setting. And then when the student leaves the setting, their IEP uh, kicks in when they go back to school. Um, right now, we're really proud that we have very high compliance rates uh, for the completion of the SEPs in both programs. Right, but it's my understanding that if a student has an IEP, remember these are, they were uh, attending a school prior to entering, uh, it's, you know, whether it's pa uh, Passages or um, East River Academy. And if a student has an IEP, their rights travel with them wherever they go. Uh, and so, you know, we, we passed a number of compliance bills to, re to require reporting on the uh, percentage of students with IEPs who are receiving their mandated services. Do you, do you have that data with you today or is that something you're gonna to have to get also get back to us uh, uh, by, by Friday? We'll have to get back to you on the compliance measures. Again, because the students are cast into SEPs and not IEPs, it's a little bit different. Well, give me an example uh, of what that what that means. If you could, because I, 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 as many of you know, I was a teacher, and so if a, if a student requires a paraprofessional to assist uh, to to stay on task, if a student requires uh, certain related services, uh, speech therapy, explain to me what what is similar, and what is different. Absolutely. So the the um, the SEP. Um, again, is designed to serve the student while they're in the facility. So chair, as you know, as a teacher, the student's IEP is written uh, for the needs of the student, but in secure settings, um, the student is often placed in class based on uh, the house they live in. For example, if they live in a hall, they only go to class with other students from a hall at Crossroads. For example, that's just an example. So things like self-contained special education um, classes are, are different in these settings because we don't always control the makeup of the classes. So we have to individualize and differentiate. So if a student's IEP says they need extra support in mathematics, we might have to push a special ed teacher into the class the student is to provide push-in support. Whereas in the community, he might have had either pull-out support or, um, or might have been in a CPT class. So that's why we use the SEP to create the best to meet the needs of the student while they are there um, in the set. And so, Gregor, if I may. Um, yes, please. So the average length of enrollment in both programs is shorter than a school year. Our data from last school year, school year 1920, for example, the median length of instructional days was 35 days in passages. It was 51 days at East River Academy. To your question about what's similar and what's different, um, I think what's similar is that we have the licensed teachers the social workers on staff. We have paraprofessionals and each program does have a speech therapist on staff. So the similarities are that we have the credential staff to provide those supports, to provide that individualized type of attention that would be consistent with the IEP. What's different is because the length of enrollment is shorter um, and because as Deputy Superintendent Marinacci said, the housing areas are not determined necessarily by educational need, but by safety needs and classification needs, we have to be more nimble in having adequate staff and the appropriate licenses and titles on at the facility that then provide either that push in or pull out type support. And students receive mandated counseling. Yeah. Um, we have uh, all of our students receive counseling, not just the right. 
special education students. So all students see counselors very frequently for transitioning and other needs. Uh, this population needs a lot of counseling. And so we have the staff to provide that. And, and do you have any uh, full-time school psychologists? Yes, in both programs we do, yeah. Uh, how many? We have two in Passages and one on at East River Academy. Um, just a couple more things I just want to get to now turn to, to my uh, co-chairs. Um, aside, you know, I think you, you had mentioned that uh, the, the task, uh, the exam, uh, there was a pause in the administration of it due to, due to the pandemic. Uh, what other goals or, or, or are there other types of goal setting um, that, that takes place in, in these classroom settings um, beyond just strictly academic work? Um, this is obviously a very traumatized student population. This is, you know, I cannot even begin to fathom the physical space um, as far as uh, the learning environment. Uh, remember, I was a high school teacher and physical space matters a lot uh, about, to, you know, to make education conducive. Um, but can anyone sp speak to me about what other goals are set for students yeah. uh, uh, in, in these settings, please? Again, thank you for this question. It's so important. And you mentioned the trauma. One of the things that we start, transitioning starts day one. And the students have been through so much trauma with the arrest and uh, uh, central booking and, and uh, the courts and everything. So we uh, have a welcoming environment with our counselors as students come in, you know, especially at the East River Academy. Again, they're voluntary, voluntarily coming in. Uh, so we really take, uh, we have a robust orientation to get them acclimated and to support them. And every student has a, a blueprint. Uh, we call it a blueprint. And one of the things on there, what are their goals? What are their aspirations? And how can we support them in meeting those goals? Um, and again, transitioning begins day one. Say, okay, let's, let's see. Let's start thinking about where you can go when you, when you uh, go back home. But I, I, I can't overemphasize the trauma again these are not students, obviously, who applied to come here out of eighth grade, uh, and they've gone through so much. I really want to give our, a shout out to our orientation people. And to answer your question before, we do continuous, with the D, DOC, we do continuous recruitment. Because a lot of times students come in, they might not want to go to school right away, but after two or three weeks, they might. So we have a zero reject policy. Everybody gets to come to school, and we don't discharge anybody because sometimes stuff happens and they don't come down for a week. Other places may discharge them. So again, thanks you for raising that trauma issue again. Uh, uh, we, that's why I'm so um, thankful that everybody is a counselor, all the teachers, everybody's very therapeutic. And like I kept mentioning in our opening remarks, very small class size. So again, that really helps the students with IEPs. But you know, in passages, more than 60% of the students have an IEP, that's three times the average uh, in, a, in a high school, for example. So again, this has been something that we've worked on for years again, is because our goal, our vision really is that everybody graduates, everybody. And but, how, how can we support them and graduate? But can someone just explain, what do you then do with students at East River that are not opting in, are not participating in the education program? Yeah, yeah, sure, Chair Traeger, thank you. Um, yes, so recruitment is always an issue. We have worked um, with the Department of Correction very closely, so there's a few different things that we do. Um, first of all, the first phase of recruitment uh, um, really starts when students are in the housing area and DOC is always introducing them to their rights to education. Um, but then we provide, we prepare a list of all students in the facility, um, again, uh, COVID has changed things a little bit, but we look forward to moving back to that and we're doing it right now again. All students in the facility who are age eligible, even if they opt out of school uh, on the, based on the forms they give the DOC, we put those students on a call down list to come to orientation. And we strive to get as many students to come an in person, do an in-person orientation as possible. I personally conducted the in-person orientation from March 22nd to March 25th on Rikers before our teachers returned because we wanted to do orientation with the students. And in the, in the orientation, we did um, things um, like a mood meter for students to assess how they were feeling. We talked about their strengths and their goals. I could say 
personally, the students were so excited to return to in-person learning. It was really inspiring to talk to them. And many of the students had been participating uh, either via the tablet who I met or on campus. So they were really enthusiastic. For the students who, now, if a student never comes down for an orientation, it's harder for us. We've done many different things with our colleagues at the Department of Correction in the past, various incentive programs. I can tell you that every year, and I would defer to my DOC colleagues uh, after this, but every year almost starts out with a discussion of what incentives could we try this year. And there have been various from breakfast incentives to uh, students being in special housing areas to go to school. We've tried many, many things. Um, because of the short length of stay and the non-compulsory age of the students, it is an ongoing challenge. Um, and it's, it was a challenge before COVID. Um, and it's at one important number that I think uh, that might interest you is 73%, uh, it's either it's between 70 and 75% of the students right now at East River Academy, this number has been consistent for a few years, come into school disconnected. They were dropped out of school before they came. So they, they, they came into school, um, dropped out of school. So we are not only trying to engage them in school in a correctional facility, which is a challenge, but also trying to engage them back in school when they dropped out of the system. Uh, overall. And, and, and that's why, you know, we began asking with attendance, because uh, attendance is a major indicator of things. And also, the kids who are not participating uh, in at East River, uh, that's further disconnection, which which w concerns me and, and, and worries me. Um, and that kind of addresses a question that we had about as part of the conditions of the funding that you receive to administer services, it talks about coordination with the previous school that these students were in and with, and, and, and once they leave uh, these sites, can anyone speak to if a student was disconnected prior to arriving to East River or Passages, what does connection look like uh, once they leave? If, if, they, if the average uh, length of stay is, as you're saying, is short. And, that, and that's why, again, we, we talk about transitioning beginning day one. So we have access to all the transcripts. One of the things we pull up with the student, the counselor, the first day, see where they are, see when they were discharged from school. Um, one of the things, and one of the, again, one of the uh, great practices here is that we run the high school equivalency programs throughout New York City, as, as you know, many sites. And last year, for example, 37% of the students who passed that test, which is a rigorous exam. It's got physics and, and uh, uh, high, high level math. 37% uh, were who passed were discharged from the school. They, they dropped out uh, of the school, which means they re-engaged and got their high school equivalency. So even if the student comes to us, like Nick said, that have, have been discharged, we can still pull up their transcript, see what level they're on, and then it start planning their next step for uh, continuing their education in, in the community. So we have access to all the former schools that the students are going to come in and we review how many credits they have and if they're on a high school equivalency track or a high school diploma track. And, and if I may on, on that, I, I'd like to add some, some things that Dr. Osanti just said and to Deputy Marinacci's comments before. We have added career and technical education um, on Rikers Island. We do have credential teachers there that provide courses. So that also is a motivation and not only a motivation, but something that gives skills for when that young person leaves and goes back to the community. In terms of, um, you had asked earlier about, you know, some of the goals and the pause on the task exam. Yes, that is true. But through, largely through our advocacy here in DOE, um, State Ed instituted a waiver um, where prior test scores and prior regents um, are counted. And so there are 13 students that on Rikers Island that have taken advantage of that waiver and have obtained their high school currency diploma during this pandemic. Now, when we resume the, the in-person testing in a few weeks, that number will obviously go up and the waiver is still in effect at least through June 30th. In terms of the outside the community and our transition work, something we're really proud of is our partnership with community-based agencies. So there's a whole slew uh, many of which the, the, the chair people are very familiar with and help support and fund through our local community that we can openly refer students to and make sure that there is admission on the other end. There are others that are specific to students that are coming out of this. But if I may, what, what, and, I'll, and I'll just I'll wrap up shortly and turn to my colleagues. 
what worries me is there is this, we all agree that we're dealing with students who are traumatized, who have obviously a lot going on in their lives and uh, for, for a variety, of, for many reasons. Um, it sounds like that there are, there is, there, there are social workers who work at these, at these sites, there are counselors who work at these sites. You had stated that many of these kids were previously disconnected from the school, from the school system. Uh, when they arrived here, they had certain level of support. Uh, I'm hearing that the average length of stay, it's, it's not very long. That's, if, is, that, is that correct, Superintendent, or please yes. correct? The yes, that is correct. Uh, and then what happens after? Then they go back to a school system where we don't have enough social workers, counselors, these kids, that the trauma still carries with them. Who from the system is responsible to ensure that these students are still receiving critical counseling services or you know, therapeutic services and making sure that they're staying on, uh, on the right track? Uh, because attendance is a major indicator of, 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 of student progress in school climate. And also I would argue literacy. Um, and if, do you have any data on reading level uh, for, for many, many of these students? And, and one final question I have here is uh, the staff who work uh, at uh, Passages East River Academy, um, are, are there any staff members in, uh, that are trained in Orton Gillingham or Wilson Reading or other, or other methodologies proven to help youth who show significant delays uh, in reading and, and, and literacy? Um, yes, uh, so I'm gonna take them one program at a time, Chair. So in Passages Academy, we have four full-time reading specialists. Um, uh, and what those specialists do is they, they're trained in a variety of different programs. However, the way that students come to them is based on a, an intake reading assessment. And then, you know, some follow-up, sometimes the students, you know, you need to check and make sure the assessment is accurate. But if they test below a certain level, the reading specialist then does an additional assessment and they decide the methodology that's the best for the student. Um, uh, um, and so there's a variety of different ones that we use, but it really is tailored to the student. And sometimes that takes into account how long the student's gonna be with us. Cause some of the uh, uh, techniques you mentioned are more long-term techniques. And if the student's only gonna be with that teacher for 30 days, um, it's, uh, the effect isn't as great. So we try to manage the prevention for the kid. And I think that you've, you've again, like, I think we're making the same point that there, there is great inconsistency for these students who are in dire need of consistency and stability. And it seems that they, they, they came from a disconnected school, school structure where there was inadequate support, um, entered, you know, unfortunately, you know, this was, you know, this was uh, something happened obviously during the course of their lives. And, and, and I, quite frankly, again, many of these kids, um, you know, they're still awaiting trial. They have not been, you know, this is not the, this is not truly due process, quite frankly. Uh, and they're even adding more trauma to their lives. Uh, but there are some increased number of social workers and counselors in this setting than they're used to in their previous setting. And then after their length of stay, they're back into society with inadequate supports and there's no one watching this from, from this macro level, watching, make sure that these kids are getting the services uh, that they rightfully need. So this is, a, this is an area of concern. I think that Chair Drum and others uh, have alluded to this for quite some time, but I'm gonna turn it over now to my colleagues in the interest of time. Uh, thank you, we'll hear from Chair Powers. Thank you, thank you. Hi there. Um, first of all, before we go on, I just want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Reynoso, Miller, and Ulrich. And I think we'll be likely joined by a few more. So I'll make sure to recognize them. Um, I just, you know, wanted to go to a couple of questions. This is more for the DOC on um, education, particularly for individuals, young adults that are in restricted housing. I was, as you know, at um, Rikers yesterday as we were looking at some of the new, where we we're looking at the restricted housing units as the Board of Corrections and Department contemplate changes to, and, and rulemaking related to solitary confinement and restricted housing. Um, can you tell us just, you know, how young adults in restricted housing units right now 
are provided access to education and educational materials? What does it and tell us what that consists of? Good morning, Chair Powers. Thank you so much for your question. This is AC Torres. Um, we are excited to share with you the fact that pre-pandemic, our partners from the Department of Education were affording in-person services in those specific housing areas. As you could imagine, um, the pandemic has posed a challenge to both agencies and presently, those services are done through learning packets that are prepared and given to us by our partners from the DOE. So right now, if you're an individual, a young adult in a restrictive housing unit, and you are looking for learning education, you are essentially getting a, a packet that's given to you. And how, how often is that given to you in terms of uh, how, how often are you getting new materials? Sure. I think that it would be best for me to defer to the DOE. I know that because they are the ones who prepare the packages. I know that we receive the packages bi-weekly and the kids are given the two weeks to complete the packets, at which point members from the department's educational services unit retrieve the packets and give them to the Department of Education. Does the Department of Education want to add anything to that? Um, no, what, what Ms. Torres said is accurate. The schedule is uh, every two weeks. As we, re we revise that schedule over time and as we return to have more staff in person on the island, it may be revisited in the future, but right now it's uh, two weeks seems to be about um, how much the students can handle at one time. And, and what, I, look, I, I don't, doesn't strike me that giving students a packet every two weeks without much guidance or teaching is going to accomplish much in terms of attainment, uh, educational attainment. So, so what, what what is the experience here for students? What what are students? You know, what is the every you know how, how many students are receiving packets? Let's see there. I might have to defer to this DOC on that because it depends on which facility they're in. So let's say let's say in uh, in uh, DOC. Uh, uh, facilities like the Rikers Island, the Rikers Island. How many students are um, being given packets every single week? So it's only the students. Um, uh, so right now it would only be students in uh, two facilities who would be given packets. Students in the GRBC facility and students in the OBCC facility. So the number I have here would be 39 students out of the 233 would have packets. The other students are uh, at RNDC and Rose M. Singer facilities. And those students are currently on a blended learning model where they have some in-person and some remote instruction. Okay, and so let's, take those, let's just take those 39 for a second because this is what we were focusing a little bit on yesterday. And um, how, how, how many of those students are completing the, that packet every two weeks in full? Well, the, the number of students changes over time. It's not the same 39. Right. So okay. it really depends. I I, but but my, my question is how many, like what, what are you seeing in terms of percentage completion of those packets biweekly? Uh, it's not a very high percentage. I'd have to get back to the exact percentage. Yeah, I mean, it's not a high percentage because you're giving packets to students is not learning. And I, 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 everybody recognizes the challenge here with COVID but I think that, and and the and the the both the health, the health you know the health concern and the challenges here, social distancing and everything. But I but I don't think it's a reasonable to believe that giving any student, by the way, this is this is not even. I mean, you have to be a pretty motivated, eighteen year old, or what you know, twenty year old, to to um uh it, you know it, I, the, the, I I include myself in that when I was you know that. It, you have to be pretty motivated without any you know, classes or ongoing learning or even, you know, otherwise incentives to do it. It feels like a strategy that was not meant to succeed from the from the start. Chair Powers, if I if I may, this is Robert Swag. Um, yes, I, I mean we agree, and 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 like you, I myself would have a hard time remaining motivated to do packets on my own. I think the, the good news now is that we are back on site with our DOE staff uh, at at least two facilities. 
as you referenced, uh, the challenges of COVID and the space constraints um, have been just a, a huge challenge. Um, but right now, the good news is that our staff is back. We plan on that continuing straight through the summer and into next school year. And as soon as we can think about ways to safely expand that on the ground staff, then we will we'll be better equipped is the only way I could really say it to, to address what you're bringing up now. We acknowledge that this is difficult. Um, I will say that, the, that a lot of thought and effort went into creating the packages by the teachers. I've gotten to see these packets. There's videos built in. Have we been able to use them and maximize them? Absolutely not. The fact, that, however, that we are back on the ground with DOE licensed staff it holds out a lot of hope and promise to, to make up for that loss. And, and I'd like to just add that students did, while it's not ideal support, there was a very quickly we established with the Department of Correction, a phone hotline available from uh, every housing area where throughout the school day, students were able to call teachers and counselors for support with that work. How many phone calls have resulted as of that? We'd have to get back to that data. We don't have to write it. Okay. Department of Corrections is for you guys. Um, it, you know, it, there seems to be a sort of an open question you know, for, for me about whether, well, let me, let, me, let me ask a direct question. Do we have adequate space and facilities to be able to provide in-person or hybrid learning to folks in restricted housing units? If, or or, or what, what is the constraint in terms of providing, uh, you know, adequate, uh, and, and equitable education for those folks? That's a very good question, Chair Powers. I know that in very specific facilities, we do have adequate space, while in other facilities, because of the um, structure, you know, keep in mind that some of our facilities are very old, um, it makes it a little difficult, and especially during this time where social distancing is at the forefront, but we are always looking as to how best to provide educational services in any given scenario. So when I um, was there yesterday, we went in over to NI, NIC and, you know, the units that we saw, the programming space that was, you know, that I think would be designated for those units, the lights didn't work and there was nothing in that. I mean, the, the, I, mean I know those units have been converted recently, as I understand it. Um, and they're, uh, I think, somewhat of a new model here. But, you know, there wasn't any actual space to provide programming. And the, I mean, it's, it's a confined space to begin with, to even just walk through it. And it's very old. And I think the concern I'm raising here is that there's not space. There, there might even be a little bit of space if you wanted to do something, but it's, there's not even any, the lights, I, you know, so, so, I, so I get the lights didn't even work in that space because we were using flashlights to, to, to go take a look at it. I, I think that the, one of the issues here is the lack of available space to do learning and programming uh, uh, in, in these some in some of these facilities, do you, do you? But it seems like you agree with that assessment. So here, if I may, the space is always a concern to us. You are correct in terms of the structure at NIC. However, we are working closely to identifying the necessary space that would allow us to afford programming. And when I mean programming, I don't mean um, cell or next to the cell, but rather a programming space conducive for counseling as well as educational services. We are using the time frame that we have, you know, from now until November to actually be able to come up with the necessary space solutions that would allow us to do educational services in a cohesive, quantitative, and qualitative way. Um, okay, and and when the um, how many young adults right now are currently housed in restrictive housing units where restraint desks are used? Oh no, sir, we don't have anyone um, in the um, restricted chair. When did that end? Actually, the day before April fifteenth. <laughs> okay, so you have you have now as of April fifteenth, last week, April fourteenth, I guess. 
and stop using restraint desks in uh, on Rikers Island and for young adults? That is accurate, Chair Powers. Okay, sorry. Um, when is okay? So you're on track to meet that deadline. Um, on on a, uh, are are individuals receiving tablets right now? And, and uh, you know, when we were there yesterday. There was a discussion about beginning rolling out tablets for. Are we talking one of the program staff um, uh, uh, that we met with, and they were talking about now deploying tablet tablets. Do in young adults who are trying to learn, they're not, they're getting paper, they're not getting uh, tablets like other individuals are getting, seem to be receiving now? So Chair Powers, if I may, are you talking yeah. about NIC, sir? No, we were, um, we were looking at some of the new units yesterday um, at GRVC, I think. And um, we met with programming staff there before we went to take a look at the units. They are telling us that certain individuals now and certain units are starting to receive tablets that uh, I think are uh, have certain restrictions on them during the day. They can access law library, I think educational murals for that. So I want to hear if there was a plan that we, we were we, more information what we were hearing yesterday from staff to do, about deploying uh, ta tablets to individuals in custody. Thank you so much. Um, Chair Powers, I, I am happy to actually um, hear you make this um, statement, and I'm particularly thrilled that you had the opportunity to meet with our staff assigned to the command. I would like to share with you that we have had the tablet program rolled out as a department since 2016. And in fact, the tablet program is part of our positive behavior management system. And our tablets at the island have two very specific tracks, enrichment and entertainment. And so when we have the deployment of the tablets, we are always careful to have an orientation with the young adults as well as the adults as what it means to receive a tablet. And so we discussed with them the fact that the tablets will be deployed to them from 8 o'clock in the morning until 8 p.m. We also addressed with them that the tablets need to be returned to us in the same way that they received it. They need to take care of them. And so there are times in which the tablets may not necessarily come back to us the way in which the population received it. And so we adhere to the fact that there is an accountability process and there is an accountability expectation. And in doing so, there are times in which as an agency based, at, as based on that accountability, as well as any security concerns, we may pull the tablets back. Our goal has always been to ensure that anything that we implement as an incentive continues Especially at this time, Chair Powers, I think it's important for us to share with you that when we were impacted by the pandemic, we immediately relied on the tablets as that remote learning for us to support the Department of Education's efforts. And as such, any interruption that has taken place with the tablets, I am happy to report to you that we have already begun the redistribution or redeployment of tablets, and it is our effort to continue to do so on a regular basis. Okay, and it was GR, GRVC, sorry to, to, to confirm that. Um, the, um, what, one of the issues we heard, I heard this yesterday and I've heard in the past, is the disruption to learning as a result of lockdowns and alarms and incidents. So what, what is this, what, what is the plan or how, how does the agency deal with, and maybe DOE, you can jump in here too, if there's particular issues you want to, you know, talk to as well, but how, how do you, how do you uh, address disruptions in learning when it comes to repeated lockdowns or other incidents that occur that would disrupt uh, learning time? And is there a plan to Try to figure out how to you know fill in the gaps of learning when when those lockdowns occur. So, Chair Powers, if I may, I I take very seriously the fact that as the Assistant Commissioner of Educational Services, 
there are minimal interruptions to the provision of education on a daily basis. There are specific plans at all of the commands on how best to minimize those interruptions. As you could imagine, the interruptions are for the most part um, as a result of any alarm status. Since I am not the best and well-versed when it comes to that, if you allow me to actually pass that question to Warden Walker, who is our warden at RNDC, who will be able to share with you what it is she does at the, R, uh, at the Robert and Dabron Center. Warden Walker? Good morning, Chair Powell. Um, Good morning. Hold on. Um, first, I would like to share that an alarm is, is an event where a staff member utilizes their personal body alarm in which they um, feel like they need assistance to manage the situation. Um, where there is an alarm, the supervisors, they work to assess the nature of the issue and um, determine if a supervisor or a pro team is needed to be deployed to that area. Um, wherever possible, we do work to de-escalate the situation and to localize the alarm response to that location, um, wherever the event transpired. Um, where possible, the tour commander or management team, we work to allow movement through the alarms for um, services such as school, um, um, school and any other educational services. Um, the goal is to absolutely ensure that these um, young adults are being provided their, um, their services. <clears throat> Okay, I mean, I just, I think we've heard, and we heard this, we were talking to individuals yesterday that, you know, there were kind of constant disruptions, it felt like, and that the ability to have sort of, con you know, sort of stable, constant learning was being disrupted by incidents. I, I recognize that the agency may not have specific control over when these incidents or, or, or alarms happen, but trying to recognize the idea that if you're trying to learn and you are you know, there's there's like these sort of constant disrupt it seems like what we heard was kind of ongoing disruptions i just want to flip because I, I see a lot of hands up and i know there's more questions ahead so i will try to questions um to and then i'll come back but um just a few more the, the doe can you talk to us more about the packets that individuals are receiving right now what is included in those packets and how are they targeted to individual specific needs or, or, or learning? And, and I guess the one basic question is, are, are all individuals receiving the same packet? Um, thank you, Chair Powers. Uh, so when it comes to the packet, uh, the initial packet that a student will get will be based on their pathway, whether they're a high school equivalency student or a high school student, right? So that makes a difference in what courses they need, and so it, it, even beyond that, as uh, Superintendent Zweig mentioned before, some students might be eligible for parts of the waiver for the high school equivalency exam. So for example, if I pass the science test and a math test, I might only need to take English and social studies. We try to target the packets to meet the students' needs. Um, the initial packets that students get uh, will be more similar, whether they're on a, depending on their pathway, more of an assessment for the teachers. And then future packets can be individualized for students as they return. And they're graded? They are graded and teachers provide feedback to the students. And are there, um, uh, you know, is there a method if an individual finishes one quicker? I mean, it sounds like there's a completion rate, it's not very high. But if, if there was a individual who completed it or uh, is there a, you know, are, are they waiting until the next two weeks, uh, uh, or are they receiving a new one as needed? So I have to give a lot of credit to uh, Ms. King and her staff with DOC. Her team uh, actually goes to the housing areas, collects those packets, and they're in the housing areas more frequently than that in order to support students with other things. So I defer to them, but I believe in any case where they've communicated to that team that they need a packet quicker, we've been able to accommodate it in collaboration with the Department of Correction. Okay. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I still think that this is not a really a great way to, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, try, try to help, you know, try to educate an individual. It is really a, um, a very thin strategy for trying to address uh, 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 what is a, a learning needs of, of what I think is 200 and something 
young adults, I think it was 233, I think was the number you said. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask one more question and I just wanna, um, and then I wanna hand it over, but I'll come back. Um, we had heard from some providers. This is kind of goes back to a hearing we did a few months ago on re-entry. This is maybe for the DOC, um, but DOE obviously, of course, add in your uh, thoughts here too. We had, we had heard from individuals that youth, uh, uh, that young adults, about 50% of them released, did not have any government issued ID, such as IDNYC, a New York state ID, a driver license, a passport. Um, and I know that IDNYC, for instance, is in our public library system. You can, I think even some schools have found ways to try to get them to middle school students. Is there an effort here to try to get, I know this is a little bit, you know, sort of adjacent to this issue, but I want to just go back to it because we, this case is from, came from this is you know, still, still in the same category generally. Um, is, is there efforts to bring in ID and YC cards to DOC facilities or to improve access to ID for young people that have been impacted here and might, might want one and particularly for reentry services might need one? I think it's for DOC. We can go and un unmute the Department of Correction. Hi, Chair Powers. Um, great question again. And we do understand and we value and support that not only our young adult population, but the adult population as well really is in need of that ID to continue engaging in employment as well as receiving all of their necessary benefits. Um, I do need to share with you that we will be happy to defer this question to our partners from MOJ as well as Moya, since we have been working with them directly. Well, I, I, you guys are the Department of Corrections, you operate the facility. So my question is, if I'm leaving a facility to go home, I need to go get a job, is there access to getting something like IDNYC as, as a, in the facility? So we're working with them to find a solution. So we are working with them to find a solution because there is a, a concern regarding identity and proof of identity. Um, and um, I, I think that we really need to reach out to our partners at MacJ and Moya to give you a better response. I don't want to mislead you in, in any fashion. Yeah, I mean, you're not misleading me. I just, it sounds like the answer is no. But the, um, um, but you know, like I recognize the sensitivity around ID and identification as a, as a larger issue that has more than just that. But I, I think there's been a, a concern raised that some of the young adults particularly are leaving without having access to it. And it might be least needed or necessary as part of a, a, a re-entry or it's just a good access point to be able to get it if they so desire. Um, I'm gonna hand it back over to, I think I'm handing it over to Chair Levin now and I see some council members with questions as well, and I may have some follow-ups as well. Thanks. Yes, we'll now turn to Chair Levin. Just bear with us, everyone who's joining us by phone. So just give us one moment, please. Chair Levin, can you hear us? You know, I think I think uh, Councilor, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Chair Chair Levin um, said he. Oh, put I'm, on sorry, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here, Chair. I'm here, Chair. Sorry, sorry I'm okay. I'm here on I'm here on audio. Um, I'm actually, if, if it's okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, let other members um, uh, go first with their questions. I'm 
I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing double duty here and, and doing child care at the moment. So um, uh, I'll be able to, uh, to, to have a little bit uh, less distractions in about uh, 20 minutes or so. So um, uh, I'll, I'll let other members ask questions first and then I'll come back. Okay, we will come back to you. So uh, first on our list for uh, committee members, we're gonna turn to council member Barron and then council member Cornegie also had his hand up, but we'll start with council member Barron. Our even starts now. Uh, thank you to the chairs for holding this hearing and thank you to the panel for coming and presenting testimony. I have a lot of questions. So there was reference made to passages and if you could please tell me as succinctly as possible, because you only have five minutes, how many facilities are secure and how many are limited or non-secure? Uh, two facilities are secure and the other five are um, uh, non-secure or limited secure. Okay, so when we get the data uh, regarding passages, can we disaggregate it to particularly the secure facilities? How many are at Horizons and uh, Crossroads? So there are uh, 37 students at Horizon right now and 71 students at Crossroads. This was as of last week. Okay, so I believe Crossroads is in uh, the adjoining district represented by council member Alika Ampi Samuel. And I've had a chance to visit Horizons once and a chance to visit Crossroads twice. And particularly at Horizons, no, particularly at Crossroads, I was very impressed with what I saw in terms of instruction. Of course, this was pre-pandemic, but I saw teachers who were very much in tune with making the curriculum relevant to the population of students that they were serving. There was one teacher who had used corrugated cardboard and uh, all kinds of little tapes or whatever to construct um, a facsimile of a boxing ring because they were having themed instruction. And the theme was boxing and, and that sport. And around the room, he had all kinds. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, but uh, having been a teacher for 37 years and also been a assistant principal and administrative principal, that was an environment that was stimulating to the students. When we're talking now about moving to uh, packets of materials that are given to children who may in fact have uh, other kinds of needs and have an IEP, which is adjusted because they're only gonna be there. If we're saying that a packet goes out every two weeks, that child may never in fact get a response to what he has done or she has done in that first packet. If it gets sent to the child, the child does it, sends it out. I don't know what the turnaround time is for someone to evaluate that packet and send it back. And if the child is there for a period of 35 days, that's only really two packets that he's getting for that month that that child is there. That's not a system that works at all. There's no engagement at all in that kind of system. So we've got to find another way for those children who are, are not in any kind of hybrid learning situation to be able to take advantage of what it is that's being offered. I also wanted to go back and uh, I read an article that talked about students being uh, having their tablets removed because they had broken some policy. And I did hear reference to the fact that this is an incentive and we want to make sure that they're responsible for the equipment, but there still has to be another way. This is not, uh, you know, an extra. This is something that students need. And my other question gets to the fact of what is the real-time interaction that students have with their instructors? The article that I had read, which was printed in November or December, said students have to pose their questions via chat. If we're talking about a population of students that may already have some deficiencies in their academic performance. It's not the easiest thing in the world to chat via uh, typing your question into um, that format for someone to respond. So I do wanna know what is the immediacy of turnaround for students who have questions to be able to get an immediate response, if not an immediate response, how long does that take? Is there any opportunity for students to interact with other students? Because that really is one of the best ways 
for students to learn, learning from each other, from their own experiences and knowledge. And the other question that I had, I think I heard an answer to the fact that the restraints at uh, Rikers are no longer being used. We did take a trip to Rikers many years ago uh, when Danny Drum was the chair and we saw those restraints and they were horrible. I don't know how they would think that anyone would want to take advantage of an educational opportunity when they would have to be restrained in time explained. That environment. Thank you. When they would have to be restrained in that environment to try to take advantage. So I'm glad to hear that that's no longer the case. But I do want to have an answer to those other questions about students having students who are remote having an opportunity other than through a chat to be able to interact with it with their students. Has that been changed? And how many students actually are using the blended or hybrid model? And can a student have immediate ability to connect with someone via phone? I heard someone in the testimony say that students can connect via phone. Is how, how immediate is that connection for students to be able to get information to their questions, academic questions from someone or to reach out for uh, an immediate intervention, perhaps from a social worker. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Councilman uh, Barron. Uh, thank you also for your comments on uh, Crossroads. I know I was there myself two weeks ago, very impressed with the uh, yes. teaching and yes. the collaboration among ACS and our teachers. And also something, a uh, small point, but a big one is that we had a lot of substitute teachers filling in during this crisis. So I think that's a, a, a shout out to the Department of Education. Uh, so let's uh, address the uh, passages uh, issues first. Uh, I, as far as the packets, the packets are only on Rikers Island. So uh, uh, as far as passage, uh, passages is concerned, I think most of these questions have to do with uh, Rikers, right? Uh, yeah. It, um, in reference to the article you mentioned, uh, Council Member Barron, and thank you for that, the students um, since uh, January have had the ability to speak in passages to their teachers back and forth over the computers. So they could both talk and electronically chat. Um, so that has been rectified. And again, we are moving away from packets, right? Uh, yes. As in, in person it, learning. In juvenile detention, there, there, there really are no packets. The only time a student would get a packet is if they're brand right. new and we have to enroll them or, or something right. else happens in immediate. But we work very closely with ACS to uh, ensure that the students have access to the technology they need as quickly as possible. The, the tap, the, no technology has been taken away from any student as any kind of form of punishment. And, and if I may, um, I, I personally observed the lesson last month at Passage Week where it was real time interaction in a high level math class between the teacher and the students. Um, I observed it virtually, um, but very heartened to see that it was real time interaction. And that was at Passage Week and it was a uh, horizon team. And Council Member, you asked how, the schedule. So all the students at Passages are on a hybrid schedule. So they have some in-person and some remote. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if I could just ask, the learning that takes place on Rikers, is it within one designated area or are there several rooms? I remember seeing several rooms uh, when I went many years ago. Where yes, we have, a, we have a school area um, in both our, in every facility we have a school area, but right now we're operating in person is in R and DC and the Rose M. Singers, in both those school areas, there are multiple classrooms. Multiple classes in different areas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the chairs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair Trigger. And, again, and again, kudos to the, to the staff uh, at Horizons and Crossroads, particularly at Crossroads. I really appreciate what you've done. And also want to say uh, there's also an affiliation with one of the community-based organizations, Man Up, where they are bringing their experience to those who are being held, who are in these facilities to let them know, listen, you've got to find alternatives to methods that you have previously been using. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair Trigger, while we give more time to Chair Levin, I will turn it back to you and then um, I'll let you know when we're uh, ready to hear from uh, Chair Levin. Thank you. Um, I'm also just making sure that, I, I don't know if this was answered, and forgive me if it was just for clarity, 
Um, the uh, attendance rate uh, at uh, East River Academy, uh, did folks provide that number for East River? So um, it's important to note that the educational programming is non-compulsory. And um, in terms of tracking daily attendance, because the uh, some students were on tablets while other students were on, in packets, it was impossible for us to accurately capture the daily attendance for the students who were working on a packet. Um, our recent return to blended learning should allow us to get a more accurate picture moving forward. And so we just don't want to, we don't have accurate daily attendance data to share because of the use of the packet system. But what do you have available for, for us today that you might need to get back to us additional, in additional days, but do you have anything you could say about attendance at East River? Because that seems to be a pretty concerning answer. I mean, we could, we would, we just don't want to share the data that we have because we need to, it's not, because of the packets, it's not an accurate reflection. So we want to, now that the students are in person, we'll be able to supply more accurate attendance data once we, in the weeks moving forward. We just started in person on April 5th. Right, but schools were still taking attendance even with the different blended models. And I'm sure that that's still being required. Yeah. Uh, is there anything you could share with us today? Uh, um, unfortunately, not today. Um, again, as Deputy Marinacci said, that it, I'm not sure we would characterize it as a blended model before our teachers and staff were back on site on April 5th. It was really the packets, it was hard to really kind of manage what that looked like. Was, was a student doing it all in one day? Was a student doing, you know, taking each day a little bit of time? So, so we really, unlike the rest of our district, and, and I understand and the rest of the system, we didn't have a process whereby to do that. Now, since April 5th, that, that students are being taken to the school floors, escorted to the school floors, both in Rosem Singer and RNDC, we now will have, in, by the end of next week, four weeks of data that will tell us what the actual attendance rate is um, based on who's coming into the school floor and interacting with teachers. Um, I know not a satisfactory answer, but one, it's, it's the only one we have at the moment where, where we're very confident that we're going to be in much better shape now that our staff is back on the premises in April 5th. But, but just so we're clear, you have the data, but you don't want to share it. Or are you, are you saying that you, because attendance, taking attendance, that's not negotiable. You have to take attendance. Uh, do you have the data and you're just, you just don't want to share it today? Is that correct? We, no, we don't. We don't we, have daily attendance data for Rikers Island because we're not able to take daily attendance on April Pass. Taking attendance, it's that's a part of our job. That's I, that's why. Can you elaborate why you're not taking daily attendance? Sure, Chair. As you know, during remote learning, the attendance policies for the entire DOE have been changed to talk about interactions and other things. So attendance policy has been differentiated. In this site, we did the best that we could in terms of recording all the work that we got back from students. Um, but it just wouldn't be accurate to say the percentage is a daily attendance because again, when a student is working on a paper packet, we don't know if you did it on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, or they weren't turning them back every single day. I, I have to tell you, this is the first time I've ever heard this. Uh, and, and to be clear, uh, my committee, we actually had to subpoena the DOE to get attendance data from last spring because they were stonewalling us for quite some time. Uh, I, I, I it, this is not not just not satisfactory. This is this is this is bizarre and this is very concerning uh, because even if even if the data is concerning to you, um, we need to know that because we need to know how to target more support. To where it's needed the most, attendance. It's is really important for us to know. Uh, even with handouts, there are ways of communicating, and there are ways of 
uh, making sure that our students are accounted for and that they're okay. Um, what, 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 can, what can we do to get uh, data and information in real time about students showing up or participating because not knowing is just, that's just not acceptable. So now that our staff is on the premises, we can get real time data. Um, and so we can actually, I, I said that by the end of this month, we'll have a month's worth of data, but I heard you clearly at the beginning of this, this uh, hearing by this Friday. So we will give you by this Friday, what the attendance has been since our staff returned on April 5th. Um, because that shows us who actually came to the school floor, who interacted with teachers. Prior to that, prior to our staff coming back, we don't have a way of measuring that daily attendance. Um, I, I can't really, I'm sorry, say anything more than that. It's not stonewalling, sir, please. We, we're not, uh, we're sitting here with all sorts of data. It is a, a, a totally unusual situation that existed at Rikers Island prior to us having staff back on April the 5th. And our okay. staff do not have the ability to reach out to students. Students are incarcerated in a housing area. You can't call a housing area the students who need to call us. Right, but you know, I, I'm just not sure if I can accept an answer that we just have had zero connection with students. Like well, zero. We have zero connection. That's not accurate. We didn't so, know we were we, right, we but if, if, right. So I'm saying, if you if you were able to reach to reach them to give them a packet, how are you not able to reach them to take attendance? We can gather information on the completion of the packet. Right. We just couldn't. When you think about traditional attendance taking, it is is the person physically in a classroom on Wednesday, April 21st. That's there is no way for us to accurately reflect that through the use of the package. And so we wanna make sure whatever data we provide is accurate. There's no phone calls. There's nothing else that can be done. We, can, we can't we can physically call to the DOC, who we work very closely with AC Torres and E.D. King, because the phones were made available in the housing areas. And we had staff always ready to engage in Iraq, but we didn't control the phones and there's no number unlike anywhere else in New York City that we have an opportunity to call in. So it was always a call out. And so that whole structure is just so unusual that it's the completion of the packets that's our proxy for attendance, but gauging that interaction as we define attendance, even in a remote paradigm, we couldn't do with other than through those packets. We just couldn't do until right. our return. Right. So, how would a social worker know who needs services? How how does a social worker make connections during this time? So, the way our social workers did it was we would send communications through with the packets with the schedule. You could call your social worker. We would send communications to the students about what's available, and letting them know that they always have the opportunity to call. Um, there were some students who did call and we were able to engage with those students. And did, did, were there any notes taken about the number of kids who reached out to make connections versus kids who did not? Yes, we have data on, uh, we don't have it here, but we can get to the data on how many phone calls were made. Um, the system just tells us whether or not a call was made, but our council so, when they talk to students. So that's, that's an example of a connection beyond just giving a packet. And that's yeah. kind of what I'm talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And students also, you know, we're talking a lot about the packets, but many students also had access to tablets during this time. And for the students who were on the tablets, they also had a way to message with the teachers it, and counselors. It wasn't in real time, but we did get messages from students that day. Okay. I think Chair Levin is now back on. I'll, I'll turn to him. Thank you. We will go ahead and unmute Chair Levin. Chair Levin, you will see a prompt asking you to accept. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank my chairs and I want to thank the uh, administration again. My apologies for um, uh, uh, whatever my situation here. Um, so um, uh, I'd like to ask about um, uh, vaccinations. Are, are all students um, in either, uh, either East River Academy or 
um, or passages over that are that are 16 years of age or over, are they um, are they getting vaccinated now? Are they being provided information around vaccines? Um, how are they getting vaccinated? Yeah, uh, from DOE, we would have to pass that to our agency. Can we go ahead and unmute Commissioner Barrios? Thank you very much, um, Council Member Levin. So a number of youth in our secure facilities have received their vaccine. As you know, the Pfizer vaccine is available for you 16 and over, and the Moderna vaccine is available for persons um, 18 and over. Okay. What, with the ultimate interest, you know, with the ultimate goal of getting um, back into um, uh, in-person classes, um, vaccine is in, you know, is essential to that. What's the, what's the process? How, how are they, how are they getting vaccinated? Uh, how many have been vaccinated? What percentage? Can you share any of that with us? Of the students in the schools? Um, we already have a process in place um, to vaccinate youth um, in our secure facilities um, with support from the Vaccine Command Center and through our health services provider, the Floating Hospital. Um, that process, however, requires um, both consent um, from the youth and the parent, assuming that young person mm -hmm. is 16 and 17 years old. And obviously, youth mm -hmm. that they over consent for themselves. As you know, there is currently not a mandate um, for young people to be vaccinated. Um, but with respect to the question about how does that impact education, I'll defer to my colleagues at the DOE. Okay, yeah, but but I, I do want to know some some numbers. I want to know how what percentage of youth at this at I, I want to know what percentage of students uh, uh, that are eligible for the vaccine, so 16 years of age or older, at passages, and then what percentage at East River Academy um, who are all eligible for the vaccine are vaccinated at least with one dose right now, and really would like to know one dose and two doses. So, right, council member, I can speak to the number of youth that have been vaccinated in our secure facilities, but with respect to the mm -hmm. question of the percentage of students, that one I'm gonna kick over to the DOE. Um, currently, we've had six, seven youth total who have um, been vaccinated. Um, us having obtained the necessary consents. Um, six of the seven have already received their second dose um, and we are continuing efforts to try to um, um, provide the necessary information and education to both youth and parents um, so they can make an informed decision about getting vaccinated. Okay, but that, so that's seven, six or seven out of how many? So I'd have to go back to um, uh, our census, and I can get that information for you, um, Council Member. Okay, but that's out of that's out of like over a hundred, so that's under under ten percent, right? Approximately. Yeah. So that's obviously not acceptable. Um, I mean, it, it, it's it's essential to have young people. I don't I don't know what the process of of obtaining that. Um, obtaining that that consent is but um you know maybe maybe that could i don't know who, who's in charge of obtaining the consent is that acs doc department of health who's, who's who's in charge of that so for acs juvenile facilities um acs is responsible for working with young people and parents to obtain consents um again um there is not currently a mandate for um, young people to be vaccinated. Um, and therefore we have to work with both the young person and the parent in cases where young people are ages 16 to 17. In some situations, you might have a young person who says yes, 
with a parent who refuses to sign a consent um, or vice versa. Right. Uh, I imagine there's logistical so, challenges to it. That's why right, I want to know right. what the logistical process is. Yeah. And so we may the, 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 yeah. the, the, the issue for me being that, you know, if we're not able, if we don't have a process that is effectively getting more than 10% of, of, of students in, um, uh, in, in detention vaccinated, then, um, uh, you know, if we don't have an effective process, then we're definitely going to get um, back to in-person learning. I mean, how are we going to get back to in-person learning if we don't have, if we don't have, uh, we don't have an effective vaccination regimen for them? So we, we do have it, council member. As I stated, um, we have a process in place um, to both obtain consents and to provide. No, I, understand, I understand there's a process, but the process right now is 10% effective or less. Um, these, uh, you know, young people, uh, uh, everyone over the age of 16 has been eligible for a vaccine, um, uh, at the Pfizer vaccine for, for weeks now. Um, so, you know, I would expect that that number would be, you know, if it was 30% or, or, uh, 40%, that would be one thing. Uh, 6% is, uh, it's just, it, it, that does not give me a lot of confidence that, that this is going to, you know, be widespread enough to be able to have in-person learning. So, so council Berman, if I may, I just wanted to clarify that in-person learning is available, um, at our secure facilities. So whether or not kids are vaccinated has no bearing on their ability to receive in-person instruction. Um, but we will continue to make efforts, and we have, um, to speak with more young people in Paris, um, to provide them with the necessary information um, to make an informed decision about getting the vaccination. And, and in person, the in-person option right now is entirely at the, at the, at the young person's discretion. No, sir. I'm going to defer to the DOE on that, but no. I think we need to refer to the DOC for uh, vaccination on Rikers Island. Hi, this is okay. Commissioner Torres from the DOC. I'll be more than happy to speak to our uh, provider, CHS, to be in a better position to give you any data related to vaccinations. For the young adults. But you don't have it with you at, at your fingertips right now. Sir, I don't. Okay. Um, uh, um, and then, sorry, back to my, my, my previous question. Then, who, who's, who, who makes the, the decision as to whether a young person is remote or in person right now? Uh, all the students at Crossroads and Horizon are on a blended learning schedule. Uh, the schedule is by fall. So the, when, a, when a hall comes down, when a hall is scheduled to come to school, the entire hall comes down to school. Can you repeat that last part again, I'm sorry? Uh, whenever a hall is called down to school or a housing area is called down to school, the entire hall is brought to school. You know, with the obvious exception of court or a medical issue. Yes, um, so, okay, so moving, moving along, um, uh, I want to ask about um, uh, youth in segregated units or young people in segregated units in um, at Rikers. Um, uh, I'm a little bit um, perplexed. There, there's no in-person uh, opportunity for them or or um, uh, remote option. It's purely the packets for them. Is that right? I'm sorry, were you asking us that question, Chair Levin? Sorry. I'm asking, I'm, I'm asking uh, the Department of Education for the young, for, for people that are in, um, uh, that, are, that are in segregated units at Rikers, um, at the East River Academy, is that, are these, um, I, when you're talking with uh, 
uh, with Council Member Power, you mentioned, um, you spoke about um, the, the, uh, the packets every two weeks. Are there no, there's no uh, in-person option for you in, in segregated units in, uh, at uh, East River Academy? I think it depends on what you mean by segregated units. Um, the, their in-person options are currently at two facilities, RNDC and Rosen. And that's where the overwhelming majority of the students uh, are. Um, and so, Chair Levin, this is Robbie Clive again. Um, and so we in the DOE in those two facilities serve every and any student that, that is escorted to the floor. I think um, our colleagues at DOC may be able to better answer about how those decisions are made. Um, but from the DOE perspective, any student brought to the school floor in either of those two facilities, we serve in person. Um, but who is escorted, I think, is more of a DOC and perhaps our DOC colleagues can can answer that a little more thoroughly. Hi, this is AC Torres from DOC. Could you please just repeat the question for us in order to give you an accurate response? So, so, so students that are that are not in general population are in are in a segregated unit of some kind at Rikers. Are they are they provided with the option of in-person learning? I think that that Councilmember Traeger, I mean Councilmember Councilmember Powers. Um, you had an entire back and forth with him around the the, the packets that are available for uh, uh, that are given to those students. Well, thank you, Chair Levin. I, I think I understand your question. When he came to my statement to Chair Powers, I indicated to him that pre-pandemic, we had staff members from the Department of Education assigned to any of our um, restricted houses, which, of course, at the present time, um, due to staffing as well as the social distancing, we have not been able to, to do so. We are always... But well, Sorry, sir? But are these, are these, are these, are these students uh, given uh, tablets? They are given presently learning packets as well as... Access no, no, tablets, to tablets. Why not tablets? Tablets, why not tablets? So where we are right now in terms of one specific housing area or two housing areas, we always need to look into number one, connectivity, and also any security concerns that are posed to us by the commands. We are always willing to explore how best to provide educational services, but at this very moment, the only best option happens to be learning packets. That's not, that cannot possibly be the case. Why, explain to me why a learning packet is a better educational option than um, a remote learning through tablet. So if there are any security concerns, keep level, we are not, quick to actually give the tablet out. We are in fact discussing how best to move forward with that. We are not wait, I'm sorry, can you, can, wait, I'm sorry, can you, re, can, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Why, why are you not giving the tablet out? Because there are some security concerns. Like what? What would be a concern, security concern? Well, we need to basically share with you that there are concerns with connectivity, there are concerns with how tablets could be destroyed, and how in being destroyed, those components become sharp objects that can seriously, number one, hurt the individual who has been assigned to the tablet, can hurt any other peers assigned to their housing areas as well as staff. So, so the, the concern is using a tablet as a weapon? Is that the concern? So the concern is dual. The concern is the possibility of security breach in terms of connectivity and as well as being used as a weapon. 
I'm sorry, I don't understand the, the connectivity issue. What's the connectivity issue? So there are areas within our facilities that even though we have created hotspots and we have gone out of our way to work closely with IT, that regardless of how much um, effort we put together or forth, we are still unable to assign a tablet that will establish connectivity. But that's not a security issue. That's just a, that's, that's an IT problem. That's correct, sir. But we're a year into the pandemic and we haven't figured out the IT problem. So I'm sorry, but um, I might be at a loss, Chair Levin. I hope that you know that every effort is made to ensure that the best remote learning capability is afforded to any young adult who is interested and enrolled in educational services. Okay, but I'm sorry, but you, you cited two issues. One is the security issue where they could potentially break the tablet and um, and use it as a weapon. I imagine the the glass, a glass shard, for example, could be used as a weapon. Um, maybe the tablet itself could be used as a weapon. I think there's probably some way to address that issue uh, as a security issue. Um, uh, the other issue you mentioned is connectivity. The connectivity issue for every, I mean, there has to be a solution. You know, you, you can get connectivity, you know, in the, in, in, in the South Pole. Like you, you can, you can, you can make, this is just Rikers Island. It's, the, it's in the middle of New York City. You should be able to have a, a level of connectivity uh, for, uh, for a, a, a segregated housing unit, a restricted housing unit. That's I don't understand. That's so. Those are two issues that I'm saying. That if if I was if if, if I was uh, working on this, uh, I would say okay. So we have two problems to address, and and I would work uh, to find out how to address that problem. Not come back a year into the pandemic and say. You know, that's the reason why we're just giving people in restricted housing a packet. And we'll come back two weeks and see if you have filled it out. And if you haven't, then no big whoop anyway. That's your education. That's not an education. So I'm sorry. I just, it, 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 we are 13 months into, a, into the pandemic. We've had a lot of time to figure out a connectivity issue. Um, and if we have to encase the, the, uh, the iPad in, um, uh, in, a, in a substance or some kind of secure encasement that makes it so it cannot be broken and then um, chain it to the wall, fine. You know, then you can't take it out of your cell. I don't understand why that is uh, so hard. So Chair Levin, we agree with you that we always need to explore how best to provide educational services. We are committed to doing so. You know that the tablets that we use are indeed in a very secure case that oftentimes is compromised. And so we will continue to explore how best to move away from the learning packets and go into a different route, whether it is through tablet or whether it is through once again video conferencing, which we are already affording at Rosensinger and RNDC. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, obviously, I'm 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 not not satisfied with the status quo. So, um, uh, uh, the second topic is um, uh, I've read and please uh, correct me if I'm wrong that. Um, that tablets are being um, uh, revoked from um, from from uh, from students as a as a form of discipline. Is that correct? At either East River or Passages? Can we get uh, Assistant Commissioner Barrows? 
Sure, if we could please unmute Commissioner Barrios. Thank you for the question, Council Member Levin. Um, all youth in ACS's care are entitled to quality educational services, and we do not prevent any youth or students um, from participating in those services as a form of punishment. Um, as my colleagues at the ACS, I'm sorry, at the DOE noted earlier, um, all students are issued um, DOE Chromebooks um, for remote learning. Um, and ACS also provides um, tablets that are used for recreational and educational purposes. But under no circumstances do we um, take Chrome away from kids as a form of punishment. Nor tablets, nor Chromebooks. No. You're, you're, under no circumstances are tablets or Chromebooks removed as a form of discipline. Not for educational purposes, no, sir. Okay, it's the same, is the same true for DOC? So when it comes to the DOC, we, Chair Levin, do not remove the tablet as a form of punishment. It is not what we do. The only time, and keep in mind, I, I don't know that, um, that I made myself clear before, but when it comes to the tablets that have been rerouted to educational services, those are tablets that originally were purchased as part of our positive behavior management system. Never do we take away um, the tablet just as punishment or to impede the young adult's progress as it relates to educational services. We do so when there is a security concern or when there is a lack of adherence the contract that those who are interested in accessing the tablet have unread, understood, and signed with us. Okay, so what is the what is an example of so that that seems like a kind of a, a big caveat there at the end. What's an example then of of violating the contract? Sure. I'll give you the example of tampering with the um, case that ignores the tablet. I'll give you the example of, you know, we made the tablets available from eight o'clock in the morning until 8 p.m. The kids know that in order for them to be able to use them and have the tablets ready for the next day's distribution, the tablets need to be returned um, by eight o'clock at night. They know too well that they're not to use the tablet codes that have been assigned to their person. They're not to share it with any other young adult. Um, and those are just a few of the examples. But I think that what is crucial we So then so then if those so if those if, if they do engage in any of those activities, the tablet could be removed from them and that's when they would be given a packet. So I, I need to share with you that when we identify somebody who is doing that, we always have a conversation with them. Uh, the removal is not something that we do immediately. We basically have the conversation with the person, whether it's a young adult or whether it is an adult. And, and then, I'm sorry, is, is it, they, going back to ACS, is, 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 ACS is different in that it's the, 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 the Chromebook or the tablet is never removed from, from the, the student, or is there a similar contract um, no so just to be clear the chromebooks and tablets are not um, taken away for educational pr um, purposes as a form of punishment now there were there was an instance recently and a few last year where um, a chromebook was taken away for security reasons because youth with sophisticated technology skills were able to find a way to circumvent the security feature. And so in that situation, um, the Chromebook was retrieved, the matter was reviewed, and then um, immediately after the matter was resolved, the Chromebook was reissued. The only other instance where a Chromebook was retrieved was where a youth um, broke the Chromebook. Um, that Chromebook then had to be replaced. Um, but just mm -hmm. to be clear, we don't, remove the devices 
when they're being utilized for educational purposes as a form of punishment. Um, okay. Well, I, I appreciate uh, increasing your time. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it back over to my to my co-chairs um, and any other council members that may have questions. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levin. Um, there are no other um, committee members that have questions, so I will turn it to Chair Powers before, and then to Chair Traeger to wrap things up. Oh, if thank you, I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Chair Traeger uh, for questions, and then uh, we'll go on to panels. So I'll let him if he has additional questions. To, to get from there. Thank you, uh, thank you both. I, I just, I, I think some of the some of the parts that we we did not hear really enough today. Uh, is really the level of coordination um, between the key agency, a lot of agencies, key agencies are involved in order to make this work. Um, if one agency cannot do this uh, work alone. Um, the DOE certainly has a critical role and responsibility, but uh, provided that they're not in traditional school settings, uh, we need DOC, we need ACS, we need other folks to make sure that they're also doing their part. Um, so, and other areas that, you know, maybe just one, one last piece here, um, it's, it's the transition work. Um, what happens once students uh, leave uh, these, uh, these temporary settings? Um, the accountability, what does that look like? Uh, who stays in touch with them? who make sure that they are continuing, continuously getting the support that they need. Could, could each agency uh, take a piece, not just DOE, but could each, each agency take a piece of that uh, about what does the transition work look like, making sure that students are continuously receiving the support that they write for need? Because remember, there's a reason why we hone in on attendance, there's a reason why we hone in on these factors, because attendance, is an indicator of so many different things during the course of a child's academic life and, and beyond literacy also. Um, just trying to get a, a better grasp of what does connection look like once students are transitioned out of, of these programs. If we can hear from, from all the agencies, please. Uh, can we unmute the Department of Education? And also, I just want to acknowledge that Councilmember Drum uh, has his hand up. I'm so glad you brought this up, uh, Chair Traeger. Thank you so much. Because, again, I mentioned in my testimony in both uh, schools, the transition counselor follows the student for six months into the community. And the other big thing that we have is all these relationships and, you know, during a crisis, these relationships really get manifested. You know, they, 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 uh, you don't develop relationships during a crisis, right? It comes out, meaning that we have all these different sites in every borough. And as long as I've been doing this work, we have something called rerouting students because it may sound really good while they're in detention. Oh, I want to go to this school and then they get there and it's not the right thing. Our people reroute them to another, uh, another place. And again, uh, having District 79 with 40, 400, whatever you have, 400 sites, uh, there's all types of options like Superintendent Zweig me uh, mentioned with CTE and, and uh, mental health. We have programs, uh, high school equivalencies within mental health. Uh, so again, I want to really emphasize that six months follow up with, with the students. And again, as you mentioned, it has to be collaboration because there's multiple needs of, of our students, right? Uh, I was at Covenant House yesterday. Again, we have a lot of students who are, uh, are homeless. Uh, again, uh, 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 so again, I think one of the best things that we have is that transitional piece and it starts day one. And the last thing I wanted to say on this was, you know, when, when Spotford was around, right? Uh, there were New York State teachers there. And I was asked in 1998 to leave my uh, principalship on Rikers Island and 
open up Passage Academy uh, and have city teachers go into Spotford, right, instead of state teachers. And the superintendent said to me, have a dynamite ninth, ninth year program and some 10th grade will be fine. But we found a high percentage of overage middle school students. And it broke my heart. You know, if you go to other counties, how many eighth graders do you have in, 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 in lockup, in, in jail? So we, we, for those students, overage, again, another indicator of dropping out is being left back, right, uh, being retained. So we started uh, restart middle school, alternative middle schools. Because we said to the students, don't go back to the school you weren't going to, you know, uh, we have this uh, brand new option. Restart middle schools are in high school so that the students don't feel like they're uh, uh, out, of, out of place. So I think we've made a lot of, again, it's, it's very hard, but that's the whole point of this is to get students transitioned into a school and continue their education uh, after they get out. So I, I'm glad you brought that up. And, and I, it's something we continuously work on. We've invested a lot, a lot in and, and superintendent, just a quick follow up on that. Yeah. Um, in my experience in my district, um, when we had uh, situations with, with justice involved youth and, and families, um, one, of the, one of the sobering data points that I've come across is that the number of teenagers who um, have been through the system not once, not twice, not three times, not four times. I have young people who have been through the system over a dozen times even more. Um, can you share with me from your experience um, some of the students who have gone through uh, these alternative settings? Do you see them again? Uh, yes. And uh, one of the things that we're really proud of uh, you know, Judge Kay uh, dedicated her life to keeping kids out of uh, lockup and in, in school, out of court. So when she passed away, we were asked to open a school in her name, and it's called Judith S. Kay High School. And it's been very successful with uh, court-involved youth. Uh, I think it's a real model because of three things. It has a high school uh, diploma track. It has a high school equivalency track. One of the bad things about transfer schools is that if you go to a transfer school and you want your high school equivalency, you got to transfer out of the transfer school you transferred into. Here you have the dual tracks together and there's a third track that's uh, CTE. So again, uh, we did an analysis of Judith SK and we looked at all the different sites the students were in and the mobility. I think one year the average school, the high schools the students have been in before they came to us was four years. So how do we break that cycle of, of being rearrested I think one of the best ways is to get the students into a program that they're really interested in so they continue their education. But we definitely see, the good news is we see less over the years. Again, when I was out at Rikers, right, we had 20,000 people on Rikers. That was crazy. Uh, so I think the city's done a great job, especially I want to give a shout out to probation. I know they're not here, but uh, they've done some great work and, and we have a lot of collaborations with them. So again, breaking the cycle, I think the key, and that's why people like us dedicated our lives to this, is a quality education and connecting students to a school that they, they're gonna to stick to and, and, and thrive in. I, I wanna say in, in closing um, and turn over to Chair Powers that um, in my district in Coney Island, I think we spoke about this. Yeah. Um, we had to kind of break the mold for the adult education program uh, because the old programs were just not, not working to meet the needs of, of, our, of our families. And in our district, we partner with opportunities for better tomorrow uh, to provide uh, free adult education classes in, in Coney Island. So proximity matters, not having folks travel across the city to get basic services. Um, so we, we remove one barrier as far as transportation. Um, we provide uh, free meals, which is a barrier because these classes are typically in the evening and uh, they can last a couple of hours. Um, we provide free child care services connections. Uh, that's a barrier for, for many families and also case management services. And we're actually looking this year to add additional uh, 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 services in, as far as stipends. So when we knock down all those barriers, we're actually, and, and we have seen retention rate, uh, attendance rate pick up, the retention uh, rate uh, really improve. 
and the number of adults passing or, or, or passed a certain whether some some took the task, some took other pro, some took other type of credentials, uh, things uh, measures, and they passed. So I think the more we knock down the barriers, the, the, the better. And that's how that's a part of the work of knocking of breaking that that vicious cycle. Um, I know that uh, Councilmember Drum has his hand raised and he's been very patient. I'll turn over to Councilmember Drum. Time starts now. If we can go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair uh, Traeger, and thank you to Chair Powers and Chair Levin as well. Um, you know, I just want to um, say that I I, I um, admire and I've met with um, Mr. Lasante on a number of occasions when I was the chair of the Education Committee as well to discuss the situation on Rikers Island. So I just want to say that, um, you know, he's a very dedicated professional and, um, you know, is working with very challenging conditions as is his whole team. Um, but I do think that um, with the line of questioning that occurred today and the answers that we received, um, I think it's really important that we pass my legislation so that we can get a better grasp of what's actually occurring uh, on uh, in passages and in the academy as well. So I just want to thank you and um, and just um, move it along and say hopefully we can get this legislation passed as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Drum, and thank you for your leadership on this issue from day one. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, and I'll turn it over now to Chair Powers. Actually, no, uh, Chair Traeger, this is, uh, everyone has concluded their oh. questions and comments. Well, yeah, and I just want to echo something I heard from Chair Drum uh, uh, about Superintendent Lasante. I agree, I've met with him. Uh, he's been very responsive, accessible to me and, and to his team. Um, we just have a lot more work to do here. And, uh, but, the, but the DOE can't do this work alone. Uh, I mentioned that before, this is gonna require a partnership, more resources, we need to be innovative with the use of federal and state resources that have come in now. Um, and quite frankly, we need to uh, make sure that we don't have young people having to go through this in the first place, quite frankly, uh, and to build a more uh, just system and a supportive system uh, in, in, our, in our K to 12 and beyond, uh, because there are factors that let our young people here in the first place and they shouldn't be there, quite frankly. Um, and uh, but with that, I, I I appreciate the administration's testimony here today. We have a lot more work to do. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll now hear from the uh, other from the public. Thank you. Okay, that now concludes testimony for the administration. We will now turn uh, to the public portion of this hearing. I would like to remind everyone that um, we will be calling people in panels of persons of four to five. Everyone is limited to two minutes. Uh, the Sergeant at Arms, uh, when we call your name, will announce when you may begin. And we ask uh, that when time is called, if folks could wrap up their final thoughts before we move on to the next panelist. So for panel one, we are going to call Julia Davis, Children's Defense Fund, New York, Charlotte Pope, Girls for Gender Equity, Danielle Gerard, Children's Rights, Chauvinese Deirdrick, Trinity Church, Wall Street, and Giselle Castro Exalt. Following this panel, we will have a panel with the Legal Aid Society, Melinda Andra, Stephen Short, Mary Lynn Wurwas, and Nancy Ginsburg. So for panel one, we will first start with Julia Davis. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairs. I'm Julia Davis, uh, I'm the Director of Youth Justice and Child Welfare at the Children's Defense Fund. I want to thank you, Chair Powers, for going to Rikers so recently, and for Chair Levin and Chair Traeger for being so deeply engaged, especially around the young adults on Rikers Island. As you heard today, it is um, a very difficult time for them, and the amount of education and support services they are getting is meager, to say the best. What you heard today in terms of the access to services, in terms of education and programming is extremely limited. And so your attention and focus uh, is very timely. I have a proposal. One thing that would move us forward in this work is for the city council to write legislation and demand the Department of Correction bring back together the Young Adult Advisory Board. This was a committee created in 2014 that brought together the Department of Education, the Department of Correction, ACS, MOCJ, all the service providers, the defenders, 
folks working with young people on the island every day. This group was problem solving, partly in response to the Nunez litigation, partly in response to the city's rulemaking around the end of punitive segregation. This group did extraordinary work developing policy and practice on the ground and responding to the very real problems as they emerge in real time for young adults to get to the root problems of the issues behind violence and the new need for segregation and to connect young people with services, which I know is the intent of this committee. So I urge you to consider this as an opportunity to bring that group back together. My concern is that the department will not do this um, without your guidance and instruction. We have lost an enormous amount by not having that group together, especially during COVID, as you've seen. You know, this is a system that has been so profoundly broken throughout the COVID pandemic, and there's been great lost opportunity to serve our kids at the highest point of need. Time expired. So thank you so much for your time today. I encourage you to consider this as your opportunity. Uh, next, we will hear from Charlotte Pope, Girls for Gender Equity. Time starts now. Thank you, chairs, members, and staff for navigating this today and for the opportunity to testify. My name is Charlotte Pope, and I'm speaking on behalf of Girls for Gender Equity. We were confused to hear that the DOE doesn't have access to the number of young people eligible to be enrolled in school but are not enrolled. Um, that seems like a crucial indicator of school climate and access. We appreciate the council continuing to hold the DOE accountable to supporting incarcerated young people, particularly those newly disconnected from schooling due to the pandemic, economic crisis, and resulting push out. We want to mention that looking at the council's mandatory report on school counselors and social workers, that this school year East River Academy saw a decrease in the number of support staff down by three people, but that represents a quarter of that staffing. So we echo the concerns raised about retention. We support the legislation being considered today and expanding the scope of the law. We see in the 2020 report, DOC posted that 48 students were prevented from attending school, a jump from 17 students in the very first report. But because of how limiting that description is, we ask that intro 1224 be clarified, similar to the ways classroom removals or suspensions are reported under the Student Safety Act. So we're able to know the number of days, instances, and kinds of exclusions that are happening. Seeing also that 53% of all infractions were categorized as classroom disruptions, we call on the council to clarify these consequences. The DOE's discipline code, for example, offers a range of responses to so-called disruptions beginning with a student teacher conversation rather than the denial of educational services. We agree with the concerns raised today about the potential creation of RMAS at NIC with the Board of Corrections restrictive housing rulemaking underway, where young people would be subjected to a new kind of indefinite isolation of a cage inside a cage with compromised access to education. We outline other concerns and questions in our testimony, including any new reliance on substitute teachers, as was mentioned briefly. But thank you again, chairs and members, for the questions Time raised expired. The brought forward today. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will next we will hear from um, Shavanese Deirdrick from Trinity Church Wall Street. And I apologize if I mispronounced your first name. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Powers, Chair, uh, Chair Traeger, Chair Levin, and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice, General Welfare, and Education. My name is Shevanese Diedrich, and I'm a Program Officer for Racial Justice at Trinity Church Wall Street. Thank you for providing Trinity with the opportunity to testify in today's oversight hearing. Trinity Church is an active Episcopal church just down the street from City Hall with more than 1,600 parishioners who represent all five boroughs and form an ethnically, racially, and economically diverse congregation. In addition to our ministry, we have an establishment program that provides more than $20 million in annual funding to critical, fund, critical partners, including the Osborne Association, Fortune Society, and Exodus Transitional Community to address racial justice by ending mass incarceration and uh, homelessness. Last year, Trinity helped to form the Faith Communities for Just Reentry campaign, a coalition of over 40 faith leaders uh, across the city that seeks to address the urgent needs of justice-involved individuals leaving city jails, as well as improve the city's support uh, and services for fellow New Yorkers re-entering society following incarceration. 
Uh, as you know, a majority of incarcerated uh, individuals in New York City and state uh, do not have a high school diploma or GED, and a quarter of those incarcerated do not have either credential due to a myriad of factors that have marginalized and excluded them from receiving a quality education. Um, the intersection between incarceration and barriers to education can cause significant harm to individuals um, who seek to find employment and stability. Uh, we believe that the city, uh, while in New York City has made notable strides uh, to improve correctional education and reentry services for New Yorkers, we believe that it must do more to provide comprehensive support to incarcerated individuals in the process of reentry to remove barriers to ensuring successful and stable uh, readjustment following incarceration. We believe that the city should establish a centralized office uh, that reports directly to the mayor for all of the city's reentry services. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Giselle Castro. Time starts now. You'll see a, a box come up asking you to accept. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Just did. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, um, Chair Menz. I want to give an overview of our organization, which is Exalt Youth. We work with young people who are involved in the juvenile and criminal justice system ages 15 through 19 founded in 2006 we created a curriculum to really address the two biggest factors which is education and criminal justice um, you know systems which lead our young people um, to make substantial um, you know regress if they're not necessarily in a pathway to make you know great success and advancement overall I want to highlight some of the things that were addressed already this morning, which are the challenges that our young people face when they are in detention, and especially right now during a COVID and a pandemic era where so many young people have been left behind. Last year in March of 2020, and I cannot believe it is already almost a full year, Exalt, we pivoted into a virtual platform, making sure that our young people had access to not just a laptop, but also to their digital um, services. With that opportunity, we were able to work with ACS and we service over 20 young people who have been able to make some great and substantial you know, progress. It is our hope as an organization that services the five boroughs to have an opportunity to make a greater impact, knowing and understanding that our young people who are detained at this moment, they have multiple, multiple challenges and multiple barriers to make substantial progress, hopefully when they resume to school um, in the beginning of the fall. Um, very quickly, I want to give an overview of our model. Um, I have the testimony. If folks want to read it, um, they will be able to do so. But uh, in, the in the last few years, we have been able to not just support young people who have been in a close to home facility, but we have been able to work with young people who have been time expired. 79 and in other um, you know, school systems to make sure that our young people are not just making gains academically, but moving away from the criminal justice system. And my time expired. Once again, thank you all so much for this opportunity. Thank you. And I do just want to remind everyone that folks can make sure that they submit their written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We accept testimony up to 72 hours uh, after the close of this hearing. Uh, the next panel will be from the Legal Aid Society, Melinda Andra, Stefan Short, Mary Lynn Rowas, and Nancy Ginsburg. We will first start with Melinda. Time starts now. Hi, um, good afternoon. My name is Melinda Andra. I'm an attorney in the Education Advocacy Project of the Juvenile Rights Division of the Legal Aid Society. We very much appreciate the City Council's efforts to provide adequate funding and oversight for the DOE, and in particular, we appreciate the City Council's attention to the needs of children and youth who are incarcerated and who, as um, Councilman Trago pointed out, are among the most vulnerable of New York City's children. Um, a 2014 Vera study, study by the Vera Institute indicated that up to 85% of those children that were incarcerated um, identified as having suffered traumatic events, including abuse, neglect, and contact with domestic violence. Um, when screened up to a third of, the, a third of those children um, were found to have PTSD and depression. 
So this is a very vulnerable group of students. Um, as Mr. Lasante pointed out, about 65% of the children at Passages Academy, which is a school that serves children under 18 that are in secure, non-secure, and limited secure detention, um, do have disabilities, have, learned, have been identified as having learning disabilities. A great number of students that have not been identified also are behind in their academic skills for a variety of reasons and perhaps have not been had tested um, or have other factors that have led to them being behind in their um, academic achievement. So this is an extremely vulnerable group of students. And while the students at Passages Academy are now receiving some in-person instruction, um, it is important to note that that has not been the case throughout the pandemic. Um, from March 16th through the summer of 2020, students attending Passages Academy did not have any contact with their teachers unless they made the affirmative Time expired. attempt, excuse me, to reach out to them. Um, and many students who required individualized attention did not receive it. It was only in September when students at Passages were able to see and hear their teachers and only in February were they able to speak with their teachers through the microphones and their devices. So we are asking that the city council um, continue to support the Passages Academy and to um, do its utmost to remediate the learning loss that these students have suffered by ensure, doing its utmost to ensure that the DOE provide daily in-person instruction to these students. Um, and to ensure that funding is provided to con ensure continuation of the tutoring programs that have been established for them beyond the 2021 school year. We also ask that the DOE create a system for quickly determining and delivering compensatory educational services to students with disabilities that did not receive the full amount of special education services to which they were entitled. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Stephen Short. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Stephen Short, a supervising attorney with the Rights Project at Legal Aid. We're at a critical juncture. For decades, Legal Aid has served as class counsel in Hanbury versus Tom, a class action challenging the city's failure to educate those in its class. Hanbury has resulted in progress. In 2018, however, the Hanbury Monitor found that education for young adults was a persistent problem. The situation worsened when the city abandoned its young adult plan, making access to school even more precarious. Amidst the global pandemic, schooling on Rikers has collapsed. DOE has not been on the island, charge participation, and DOC has failed to inform of their eligibility, facilitate access to remote learning, or maintain the safety necessary to keep education operating. Hanbury class members have gone the length of the pandemic without meaningful education. As the city reduces blended education and in-person education on the island, it must recommit itself to the young adult plan, facilitate access to school, inform students of their eligibility, and replacing restraint chairs with other draconian interventions such as cages. Additionally, DOE must convene committees on special education, update set, and ensure students are receiving services. But there is no Progress without accountability. These agencies must answer for their failures during this pandemic, which have set students back. The council should evaluate DOC's constant meeting of educational access and DOE's insufficient educational offerings, including perfunctory educational and unreliable remote options. Put bluntly, remote learning or self has always been abysmal and should be an affront to educators. Finally, this is a race justice issue. As borne out by statistics disclosed earlier in this hearing, Black students and students of color targeted and ensnared in the legal system, trapped in these cycles of educational inequity. This woeful situation would never be tolerated in a predominantly white school. Time if expired. Based justice, we prioritize educational equity. And that starts by holding these agencies accountable for this lost year and ensuring that these failures do not persist. Thank you. And <clears throat> excuse me, next we'll hear from Mary Lynn. Rowas, time starts now.
Oh, Marilyn, one moment. Sorry, you should see a window come up asking you to accept the unmute. Thank you. Okay. Um, good afternoon, uh, committee members. I'm Mary Lynn Rollas, the director of the Legal Aid Society's Prisoners' Rights Project. And thank you so much, Chairs Traeger, Powers, Levin, and all the members for inviting us today. Uh, Mr. Short provided you with some of our recommendations for education that are rooted in our role as class counsel in Handbury, but equally relevant. And what I'm going to address are some of the lessons of Nunez which is now a consent decree governing use of force in jails and protection of 18 year olds. And the two are deeply connected because the abysmal state of education for youth at Rikers is intertwined with the culture of violence and impunity. Students cannot learn if they're not safe. And Nunez shows us that students in the Rikers jails are not safe. This is a level of danger and insecurity with no parallel on the outside. And as a New York City public school parent myself, I will add, I am certain that there's no school in the community that at any point in this horrible last year would have tolerated biweekly packets to be a substitute for education. But we strongly encourage the council members to read the Nunez monitors reports uh, for many reasons, but including the alarming use of force problem at RNDC. The use of force rate there, which controls her population went up 200% between 2016 and 2020 for 19 to 21 year olds. A significant driver of this violence is staff instigation of conflict and over-reliance on probe teams and alarms. And the department's operational decisions to default to placing youth in highly restrictive settings where education demonstrably cannot be provided. If the Department of Correction does not demand competence from its supervisors and leadership in implementation of the school program and reduction of violence, Time it will not reduce the violence in our jails and will fail the students who are trying to learn there. Then there's just no excuse for the failure to hold supervisory staff, wardens, deputy wardens, captains, responsible for what is happening in these facilities. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we will hear from Nancy Ginsburg. Time starts now. Good afternoon, chairs. Um, my name is Nancy Ginsburg. I'm the director of the Legal Aid Society's Adolescent Project and the Criminal Practice. We are at a moment of crisis in the care of custody of young adults on Rikers Island. And a meaningful conversation about delivery of school services cannot happen until security is restored in RNDC, the building that holds the young men. Over the last two and a half months, it has come to our attention repeatedly that RNDC has become alarmingly dangerous. This caps a pattern of DOC withdrawal from years of commitment post Nunez to a young adult model based on age appropriate services delivered by specially trained officers. We recognize that COVID has presented many challenges in the past year. Nevertheless, there had been commitment to work with the young people in RNDC. Efforts to mediate conflict led to improved conditions in the building. Despite these advances, the department removed the warden engaged in this work and installed new leadership. That change precipitated an almost immediate downward slide, resulting in increased incidents, daily alarms, and deprivation of recreation, programming, medical, and mental health care. Individuals are moved from housing unit to housing unit, and some have been told they were intentionally being placed in harm's way. Creating unnecessary conflict has led to record high numbers of young people transferred to restrictive housing. Our clients, in addition, have not been produced for council visits. In addition to increasing the amount of time sequestered in their housing areas, the decision was made to take away the tablets from all young adults. There are no tablets in RNDC. Further exacerbating these conditions, during a time when the building is closed to the public, K2 and other illicit drugs are being brought into RNDC, time causing expired. some of our clients to suffer serious adverse reactions. In 2016, the department created an advisory board focusing on adolescents and young adults, and we are calling on the council 
to call again for creation of this advisory board. There is no reason to believe any longer that the department will do right by the young adults and will follow a specialized young adult plan without outside oversight and input. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the testimony for this panel. Chair Traeger, did you have any questions for this panel or the first one? Because I forgot to ask after the first panel. Uh, and council members, please remember, if you ever have questions, please use the raise hand function on Zoom. Uh, that concludes the testimony for this panel. And next, we will hear from, and I apologize if I mispronounce names, Stephanie Batances from Brooklyn Defender Services. Nikki Woods, New York County Defender Services, Crystal Baker Burr, Bronx Defenders, and Kelly Grace Price, Close Rosies. We will first go ahead and start with Stephanie. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Batances, and I am a mitigation specialist on the adolescent representation team and in the education practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. BDS's Adolescent Representation Team works to eliminate contact and involvement within the le criminal legal system for youth age 21 and under through legal representation, advocacy, and social work services. Our specialized education unit provides legal representation and informal advocacy to our school-aged clients and to parents of children in New York City schools. We frequently work with young people who are detained in the city's juvenile detention facilities and on Rikers Island. BDS commends the City Council for its attention to education services provided to young people in the city's jails and detention, and detention centers. We believe children learn best when they are in their homes and not behind bars. The best way to provide educational support to young people will be to avoid putting them in jail and instead focus, focus on diverting them from the criminal legal system altogether. But as long as young people continue to be incarcerated, there are many ways the education provided to them can be improved. For over a year, young people have, have been held on Rikers Island with virtually no programming and only minimal education services available to them. Despite the fact that young people on Rikers Island have the right to receive education services, most young people have received no life instruction whatsoever. And many of the young people our office works with were not even aware education services were supposed to be available to them. Even prior to the pandemic, young people were young people told us that they were never made aware of their eligibility for school or were not brought to school even when they were signed up. For years, BDS has advocated for young people on Rikers Island who have struggled with education access to receive the services they're entitled to. Despite significant advocacy on our end, we have heard many stories of DOC failing to bring young people to school. The young people we serve have often gone days or even weeks at a time without attending school because DOC staff failed to bring them to school. DOC needs to do better and work to ensure everyone who wants school can access it. The young Fine. people who are with that passages have more have had more success attending school during the pandemic, and we appreciate the work that DOE has done to ensure educational access for these students is available. But we have seen problems there as well. Many young people report feeling report feeling unengaged with what they're learning or the work does not feel as if it's appropriate level. Some students tell us that they are getting work without sufficient instruction, while others feel the work is too easy, like they're just being given busy work. ACS and DOE should work together to improve programming at Passages Academy, providing more targeted supports for those students who need them to, and varied engaging age-appropriate programming for those who desire. We have expanded upon many of these concerns and recommendations in our written testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this very important topic, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And next, we'll hear from Nikki Woods, New York County Defender Services. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairs Traeger, Levin, and Powers for holding this hearing. My name is Nikki Woods, and I am a senior trial attorney with the Juvenile Defense Unit at New York County Defender Services. My unit represents raise the age children in felony cases in both criminal and family court. I generally do not have clients on Rikers Island. First, I would like to offer our support for intro 1224. This change in local law would produce data showing how existing educational and vocational programs offered to youth in juvenile detention fail to accommodate the needs of our older youth in custody. Accountability and transparency through data reporting is necessary for the city to implement these much needed changes to our system involved youth. This law will also require ACS and DOC to report rates of violence for children in juvenile detention and jails. 
instances of violence in these penal settings is woefully underreported. The truth is that our youth in jails and in juvenile detention are not safe and this must be addressed immediately. Exposing this violence, whether at the hands of their peers or detention staff, is crucial to creating better systems of accountability and for building programming that immediately addresses and curbs violence in juvenile detention. Passages Academy currently offers youth in detention and in placement uh, an opportunity to, inter to earn credits towards high school diploma. Many older youth who enter detention or placement have not attended school in a long time and they are undercredited for their age. These students may require one-to-one -one tut tutoring from paraprofessionals, but these services are rarely available. HSC programs are also available to eligible undercredited youth. These programs help re-engage youth in school. I've had several clients benefit from the pathways that Passages provides them towards a diploma. The problem that I am seeing with my older clients is that once they have received their diploma, they have reached the ceiling of educational opportunities available to them in custody. To tackle this issue, older youth in detention, placement, and jail must have wider access to college courses and more age-appropriate, career-oriented vocational Time programs. Expired. These programs are almost non-existent for youth in non-secure detention and non-secure placement. Increasing youth access to age-appropriate educational programs like college, providing one-to-one -one tutoring during in detention and expanding vocational program offerings to older youth will build stronger, safer communities and provide more positive outcomes for our incarcerated youth. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Crystal Baker Burr, Bronx Defenders. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairs Traeger, Powers, and Levin, and the members of the committees for the opportunity to speak to you today. When my teenage client, John was first incarcerated on Rikers Island prior to the pandemic shutdown. I reached out to East River Academy and requested that John be enrolled in high school. At the time, John was housed in a unit that was a de facto solitary confinement unit. He had no access to peers and he was struggling mentally and emotionally. He wanted to progress in school and have access to learning to keep his mind occupied and focus on something positive, but he was never given that opportunity. It has been over a year and John has not had a single in-person or synchronous virtual class. He has been denied his right to an education. Last fall, John was given a packet of papers, educational materials for various subjects and told that this packet constituted the entirety of his education for the year. John is a student with a disability and struggles with literacy. He has been out of school for some time. John had no teacher, no peers, not a single person to go to with questions. He made his best efforts to complete the packet, but he lost motivation because he didn't understand the work and didn't have anyone to teach him. A subsequent move to RNDC did not improve his prospects. We filed an IDEA complaint, but it was rejected with a recommendation that he enroll in a local public school, a ridiculous suggestion since he was incarcerated on Rikers Island. John was given a tablet to complete work but it didn't help. John needed a teacher. John is not alone. We interviewed nearly two dozen incarcerated clients about their educational needs and not a single young person has received an adequate education this year. About a month ago, many of our clients reported that their tablets were all taken away. Even though we heard today that hybrid learning has begun, none of our clients have reported being brought for in-person learning. These I'm are the expired. department. Oh, I apologize. These are the Department of Education's most vulnerable and marginalized students. And this is a racial justice issue as these students are predominantly black and students of color. These students do not have access to their family members, much less meaningful access to books, writing implements, or the internet. There are young people who, because the legal system has slowed to a snail's pace, have lost their opportunity to graduate. They're losing school credits and high school equivalency diplomas. DOC and DOE must give students access to actual in-person instruction, IEP services, and HSE classes. Students that are released should be given free tutoring or other comp ed services for the time that was stolen from them. They should be guaranteed seats at other D79 schools and given priority to attend vocational programs. Navigating the transfer school application process is not easy and often takes a lawyer and a social worker from our office to assist in order for a student to be enrolled. These students should be guaranteed a seat when they're released. This time stolen from them cannot be given back, but the city can take informed actions 
to give these students educational opportunities now and in the future and acknowledge the harm that has been done. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And next we will hear from Kelly Price. Time starts now. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. I'm Kelly Grace Price from Closed Rosies. <clears throat> I'd like to thank Chairs Drum, Powers, Levin, and committee members for holding this hearing today. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. You might recall that back in uh, 2019, the City Council held a hearing on programming and books and education in general on Rikers, not just for youth. And I submitted data at that time showing the paucity of programming, educational and uh, non-compulsory for women, girls, trans, intersex and gender non-conforming people on Rikers. Since that time, I've obtained new data encompassing uh, not just the last five years, but the last decade from, from 2009 to 2019, describing programming on Rosie's and in youth detention centers um, in New York City for women and girls. And it's shocking only a hundred, I'm sorry, 1,003 educational program certificates have been issued to the over 60,000 women and girls, trans, intersex, and gender non-conforming people on Rosie's and in Horizons over the last decade. That's uh, I, the, the paucity of educational opportunities for women and girls needs to be highlighted. I don't want to keep stumbling over my words, but it just seems insane that programming for women and girls, even though we've been discussing it for years, has not ramped up. The latest st statistics from DOC show that more educational opportunities are being provided for youth and adolescent women and girls than um, for, for adolescents at an alarming rate, actually. 95% of all programs are offered to youth and adolescents instead of adults on Rikers, which in itself is a problem, but I am happy that, that youth is getting Time to expired. Me. I'll turn in my um, testimony with my data, but I wanted to point out that we had a hearing last year about connectivity on Rikers, um, specifically uh, about visiting so that there, were, there was connectivity in all units for, for visiting or on all jails. And I'll refer you back to that testimony. Please listen to it carefully because the DOC did promise internet connectivity ubiquitously throughout the island back in, I believe, um, in April or in May 2020 uh, Board of Correction hearing. Thank you so much. And as always, I'll upload my testimony. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Drum has a question. If we can go ahead and unmute Councilmember Drum. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Grace, for your testimony also. My question is really to Crystal Baker Burr. Is she still here? Hi, Crystal. Who, who are you with again? I'm with the Bronx Defenders. Okay. And this uh, case, John, that you mentioned, am I right? Yes. Uh, okay. And then who did you reach John out to? At, I'm sorry, who did you reach out to at the um, DOE? And they told you to just transfer them to the local public school. I think I, I'm not exactly sure how you worded that. Yes, I filed a due process complaint. Um, a what? Impartial, a due process complaint under the IPA with the impartial hearing office. And they rejected my complaint um, and wrote that in their emailed response. And that, that was the solution to this to the issue. Yes, even though the allegations were a denial of education at Rikers Island. Thank you. And um, um, and then what, became, what what happened next after that? We continue to advocate for that client to receive educational services. Um, to date, that client still has not had any in-person education or um, virtual synchronous um, classes. Um, and he is at RNDC. Is at RNDC right now. How long has he been there? Um, for over, well, RNDC less time. Um, but for over on Rikers. Give it six months, yes. On Rikers, over a year. Over a year on Rikers without any educational involvement. Yes, he and he is a with a disability. Is he in restrictive housing? No, he was for a time, um, but now is at um, in general population okay. and has been for over six months. 
Okay, thank you. I mean, this is just a, an incredible thing that I'm hearing. I mean, it, it, it's somewhat familiar, unfortunately, but I just wanted to be sure I got the details of it right. Thank you. No, thank you for your questions. Do you, any other committee yes, members? Yes, I, I, I just, I, I have just a quick follow-up and, uh, and this also, this question is, is for Crystal and I appreciate her fantastic advocacy and for elevating this issue because it really speaks to many of the issues I think we're trying to get at today. Um, I don't know if you heard earlier the exchange that I had with DOE about IEPs and they, they phrased it that, that they're, they're somehow allowed to be more flexible with IEPs in these settings using a, a different terminology. Um, but it's my understanding, I'm not an attorney, but it's my understanding that the rights of kids travel with them even to this setting, that those rights don't disappear. They, they travel with them to this setting and the DOE needs to find ways to accommodate. Um, is that your interpretation as well? Um, yes, Chair Traeger. Um, they still are students with disabilities and they have you know federally protected rights and state protected rights. Um, there is flexibility given the you know um, type of housing and the nature that they are incarcerated, but I would still say that more has to be done um, and that the Department of Education is still violating these students' protected rights at this time. And I'd love to speak with you more after this hearing about that. Um, yes, and, and I also would love to learn because the DOE was kind of vague about uh, what services they feel that they cannot render or provide. Um, and just curious from your experience, what are the types of services that kids are students are entitled to, uh, but they're not regularly getting um, in, in these settings? Can you speak on that? Um, I can speak on that and um, I can actually amend some of our um, written testimonies to provide more information, um, even more information on that. Um, but I think Many of our students, especially ones that have been disconnected, um, maybe they signed themselves out, right, of services and they didn't have an IEP at their last school or um, they were out of compliance. And so when they enter a school at Rikers, um, they don't have a, you know, most recent IEP. So they're not getting any services at all or it's not showing up that they need them. But East River Academy still has a responsibility to identify students with disabilities and provide them services. And we're not seeing that happen as frequently as it should, especially in this remote setting where you can't tell if a student has a disability when they're completing a packet that you may or may not be retrieving, right? But they still have that responsibility to identify those disabilities and provide services to those students. And Crystal, in, in the, in the uh, I guess in the, in the traditional settings, uh, when you're talking about an IEP, uh, there's a school psychologist involved. Can you speak to, to the extent that school, that school psychologists are involved here? Because that is also part of the mandated process. Uh, can you speak about that? Yeah, actually it's something that me and some of my colleagues at the other defender organizations have identified as an issue currently. We have clients that do need to be reevaluated, right? They haven't been evaluated, some of them since middle school. Um, and now they're 18 and 19 and still need support services to learn, right? Um, we've made referrals for certain students to be evaluated. Um, and we're told, um, I've been told that those students aren't enrolled, students that have been actively doing work um, on tablets, but they weren't connected to, um, they weren't connected and they aren't saying that they are a student that's enrolled. So that's been an issue. Um, I've had the response that, oh, once they're enrolled, then we'll evaluate them. But then the enrollment process takes months at a time. Um, other people have had issues where um, they're told that they can't do the in-person evaluations or they have to set up a phone call time to do an evaluation for um, a young person or that they just review prior education records um, based on you know, the current situation with the pandemic, but that's also not appropriate and doesn't get to the students' you know, individualized needs. So that is something that does need to be improved as soon as possible so that we know what supports these students need. That's exactly, that's exactly it. We need to know what they need and we need trusted voices to tell us that. Um, and school psychologists can certainly play that role in addition to social workers and others. So thank, thank you for that very sobering um, information, but very important information. 
Uh, I don't know if Chair Drum is a follow-up. He does. And also, just for the record, we just want to um, say that we were joined by Councilmember Salamanca, but Councilmember Drum. Time uh, starts now. If we could re-unmute him. Yeah, just very quickly, uh, Crystal, did you bring this to the attention of Mr. Lasante? We've been in um, communication with leadership in District 79. Um, Mr. Lasante has been very helpful on um, many different issues. He's he's wonderful, but he is one one person, right? Um, and we believe that these issues are more broad spread than just one individual client. Um, and they're, they're systemic issues across the board. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no other council members uh, raising their hands, uh, if there are any members of the public that we inadvertently missed in calling, if you could please use the raised hand function on Zoom, we will call you to testify now. Seeing none, uh, Chair Trigger, I will turn it back to you for closing remarks. I uh, just want to, I, I want to actually begin by just thanking uh, Chair Drum. Uh, Chair Drum highlighted many of these pressing issues and has never forgotten about them, has, continues to, to fight, continues to push through legislation, action, advocacy. Uh, he continues to be a, a great resource for me. I am a lifelong learner and I am learning from Chair Drum. And I'm very grateful for him for always centering the most vulnerable, marginalized students. And um, I shared before, and I've, again, I want to thank all the amazing advocates and organizations for amplifying the sense of urgency here. I mentioned before about the young people in my district where it's, it's not once through the system, it's not twice, it's three times, four, it's so many. And like, where is the responsibility to break the cycle and, and to make sure that the conditions that led them into these settings in the first place are addressed and that our kids are receiving a well-rounded, excellent education in their, you know, K to 12, uh, you know, and, and also deal to provide housing security and all the other critical supports that kids need. Um, and that's why we have so much more work to do to really fix this entire school system, but centering the kids who need help, the students who need help the most. So I just want to thank Chair Jerome for always centering that sense of equity and, 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 uh, I really appreciate it. And again, thank my co-chairs, uh, Chair Powers, Chair Levin, for their great work and with their committees, uh, and to all my colleagues, thank the committee staff. And, uh, and with that, uh, this hearing uh, is adjourned. Thank you, Chair.